hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about what is binary source t data structure now let's talk about binary source t data structure binary source t or in short bst is a binary tree in which all the nodes follows two properties the left subtree of a node has a key less than to its parent nodes key and the right subtree of a node has a key greater than to its parent node's key. These are the two properties of binary source t. This is an example of binary source t. For this node, the value of left subtree is less than and the value of right subtree is greater than. So this node follows the properties of binary source t and these two nodes are leaf nodes so we will not apply the properties to leaf node this is an example of binary search tree this is a valid binary search tree all the nodes follows the properties of binary search tree except the leaf node this is not a binary search tree because the value on the left subtree is greater than value on the right subtree is also greater than so this is not a valid binary search tree now let's see some more examples this is an example of binary tree now let's see whether this tree is a valid binary search tree or not first for this node the value on the left subtree 36471 and the value are less than the value of root node and the value on the right subtree is greater than 8 10 14 13 so this node this node is following the properties of binary search tree. Now for this node, left subtree is less than and the right subtree is greater than. 6, 4, 7 and for this node, the left subtree is less than and the right subtree is greater than. And these three are leaf nodes. Then for this node, there is no left node. So let's check the right node. The right node is greater than this parent node. So this node is following the properties of binary search tree. Now this node, there is no right node. And the left node is less than this parent node, 14. So this node is following the properties of binary search tree and this is leaf node. So you can say this is a valid binary search tree. If we are given this binary tree, now let's check whether this binary tree is a valid binary search tree or not. There is no left node for every single node of this binary tree and the right node are greater than the parent node so this is greater than the node one so this is following the properties of binary search tree this node is also following the properties of binary search tree this node this node as well and this is leaf node so this is a valid binary search tree we can say if we're given this binary tree we see there is no right child of any nodes and the left child are greater than the parent 2 is greater than 1, here 3 is greater than 2, 4 is greater than 3, 4 is greater than 3. So this is not a valid binary search tree. This is invalid binary search tree. This tree is not following the properties of binary search tree. That's why this tree is not a binary search tree. If you were given this binary tree, in this binary tree we see the left of this node 5 is less than, the left child of this node 4 is less than, 4 and the left child of this node 3 is less than that is 2 and the left child of this node 2 is less than 2 and this is leaf node so we can say this is a valid binary search tree now let's see some more examples let's see whether this tree is a valid binary search tree or not this node is following the properties of binary search tree all the nodes well on the left subtree is less than all the nodes well on the right subtree is greater than now for this node, all the nodes well on the left subtree is less than and all the nodes well on the right subtree is greater than. So this node is following the properties of binary search tree. Now for this node 6, there is no right node and the left node is less than. So the well on the left subtree is less than and for right subtree, so nothing need to be done on the right subtree. So nothing need to be done for the right subtree. So this node is following the properties of binary search tree. And here 1, 4 and 9 is a leaf node. We need to apply the properties of binary search tree in the leaf nodes. So you can say this is a valid binary search tree. If we are given this binary tree and 
the value on the left sub g of this 8 is less than value on the right sub g is greater than so this node is following the properties of binary sst now for this node value on the left sub g is less than value on the right sub g is not greater than we see here 2 is less than 3 so this node is not following the properties of binary search tree. This is not a valid binary search tree. Hope you have understood what is a binary search tree. Now you might ask why we need a binary search tree. Now let's talk about search operation in an array. When you search an element in an array, it takes big of n for the worst case. And for linked list, it will also take big of n time complexity. When you use binary search tree, the search operation will take logarithmic time complexity and this is why binary search tree came into the picture if we have a huge data set if we use array or linked list then it will take a lot of times to search an element in array or in a linked list data structure but if we store the large data set in a binary search tree then we can find out the desired element in logarithmic time complexity and it's way more faster than linear time complexity and this is why we use a binary search tree hope you have understood what is a binary search tree and why do we need to learn binary search tree thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to implement these two method create binary search tree and insert Using this method, we can create a binary search tree and using this insert method, we can insert data into our binary search tree. Now let's see how we can create this two method. This is the class. This class contains a node. This node has three attributes, value and two pointer left and right. Here we have root node and this is our create BST method. This method takes no parameter. Inside here, we're setting root to null node. If we call this method create BST, then we'll create a null node and root will point to null node. Now let's talk about insert method. This is the insert method. This method takes one parameter and inside here we're calling this insert method with this two parameter root and value. And this is the method insert current node and value. We're using Java programming language. Here we have different number of parameter okay so you can use the same method inside here we're checking if current node equals to null then we're returning new node by creating the node with the given value else if we're checking if the value of current node is greater than the given value then we'll call the insert method recursively and we'll insert the data to the left node and we'll return the current node if not, we're gonna call the insert operations or the insert method with the right node and we're gonna insert that node to the right child and we're returning the current node. Now let's see how it actually works. First, if we call this method with 8, then we'll create a node 8. Initially, left and right pointer will point to null node. Here, in for null. And this is our root node, okay? So if we call this method insert with value 8, uh, then we call this method insert with the root node. Initially root is null and value is 8. So current node equals to null, then we'll return this new node by creating the node with the given value. So this is our root. Now if we call this method again with insert 3, then we'll call this insert method with the root node and with the given value. Since the current node is not equals to null we'll check the value of our current node if the value of our current node is greater than the given value then we'll call this function recursively and we'll insert the value the 3 to the left child of our current node so we'll call this method again with the left child and with the value the left child is null so we'll call with insert null and 3 so in this case we'll return just 3 so let's create here a new node 3 and this node will be returned by this function and we'll insert this node to the left child of this node 8. So 3 will be attached to this left pointer. So let's add here 3. And the left and right pointer of 3 by default null. 
So let's say in for null. I will call this method again with 9. Then we will call this insert method with the root 8 and with the value 9. And here current node is not equal to null. And the value of current node is not greater than value because, because 8 is not greater than 9. So we will move to this else statement and we will call this method with root.write and that is null and the value 9. So we will create a new node here 9 and the 9 will be attached to this right pointer of this node 8. So let's add here 9. And the left and right child of 9 is null by default. Now let's call this method again with 1. Now we're going to call this method with the root node 8 and with the value 1. Current node is not equal to null, so the value of current node is greater than 1. 8 is greater than 1. So let's call this method recursively. Then we'll call with 3 and with the value 1. And then we see 3 is greater than 1. So we'll call this insert method again with the left of this node 3 that is null. So with null and 1. And then we'll create a node with 1 and we'll attach that node to this left child. So let's add here 1. And the left and right of 1 is null by default. This function will return the root node. Okay. Then let's call this method with 6. Then we'll call this method with the root node 8 and with the value 6. So current node is not equal to null. Current node dot value is greater than value because 8 is greater than 6. So let's go to the left. Left is 3. Let's call it 3 and 6. Then we see 3 is not greater than 6. So we'll move to else statement. And here we'll create a new node with value 6. And we'll attach the node 6 as the right child of this node 3. So let's add here 3. So let's add here 6. The left and right child of 6 is null by default. So let's add here in and let's add here in. So we're done. Uh, by this return statement, we'll return the root node and it will recurse back to the top node. It will recurse back to the root node and it will return the root node. Okay. And the root node will be attached to this root pointer. And that is 8. Now let's call this method again with 10. In this case, we see current node dot value is greater than value no it's false 8 is not greater than 10 so we'll move to the right and we'll call with 9 and 10 and in this case we see that value of this node 9 is not greater than 10 so we'll call with the right node of this node 9 and with the value 10 so this value 10 will be added to the right child of this node 9 so let's add here 10 left and right of 10 is null so let's add here null and let's add here null and this function call will recurse back to the root node and the root node will be written to this by this function call and that will be attached to this pointer root okay this is our root node and this node will return this is how this insert method works this method will take time complexity big of in and space complexity big of in for the recursion call stack hope you have understood create bst and insert method i will attach the source code to this video check the source code thanks for watching i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about traverse operation in a binary search tree in the previous section of this course we have talked about in details level order pre-order, in-order, and post-order traversal. The process exactly the same. If you want to learn traversing binary tree or binary search tree, go to the binary tree section. In that section, we have talked about in details. In this video, we'll just review the four traversal algorithm, level order traversal, pre-order traversal, in-order traversal, and post-order traversal. Now, let's talk about them. First, let's talk about pre-order traversal. This method takes the root of a given binary search tree. And inside here, we're checking if root equals to null, we'll just return. This is our base case. And here, we're printing the value of our root node. And then we're calling with left child. And then we're calling with right child. 
if you're given this binary search tree and if you call this method then we'll traverse this binary search tree something like this first eight then three then one then six then four then nine and this is the direction of pre-order tower cell i'm not going to go through the source code i will highly recommend you to go to the binary tree section to see how pre-order tower cell works in details what you've talked about the recursive approach as well as the iterative approach this pre-order tower cell will take big of in time complexity and big of in space complexity now let's see the next t tower cell algorithm in order tower cell this is in order tower cell algorithm this is in order method this method takes the root of a given binary search tree and inside here we're checking if root equals to null then we're returning this is base cat and then we're calling with left sub tree then we're printing the value of current node and then we are calling with a right sub tree first we'll process all the left sub tree and then we'll process the current node then we'll process the right sub tree if you're given this binary search tree and if you call this method in order then you have to traverse this binary search tree first one then three then four then six then eight then nine and this is the direction okay and this is the list that you can get by traversing the binary search tree using in order traversal hope you have understood what is the in order traversal algorithms and this algorithm will take big of n time complexity and big of n space complexity now let's talk about the next t traversal algorithm post order traversal this is post order traversal algorithm we're calling with the root node and this is your base case if root equals to null we're returning then we're calling with left subtree then we're calling with right subtree and then we're printing the value of our current node first we're processing all the left subtree then we're processing all the right subtree then we're processing the current node for example if we're given this binary search tree and if we call this method then we'll traverse this binary search tree first one then four then six then three then nine then eight and this is the direction and this algorithm will take big of in time complexity and big of in space complexity have you have understood what is a post order traversal now let's talk about level order traversal algorithms this is level order traversal algorithms this method takes the root of a given binary t this is your if condition if root equals to null then we're returning then we're creating a queue and we're adding the then we're adding the value of root node to the queue and we're running a while loop while queue is not empty we're popping out the top element from queue here we're popping out the front element from queue and we're printing that element and then we're checking if the left child of our current node is not equals to null let's add that to queue and if the right child of our current node is not equal to null, let's add that to our queue. If we're given this binary search tree, we call this method, then we should return this list. In level of the traversal, we traverse level by level first this level, then this level, then this level, then this level. So first 8, then 3, then 9, then 1, then 6, then 4. 8, 3, 9, 1, 6, 4. And this is the direction. Hope you have understood what is a level order traversal algorithms and this algorithm will take big of in time complexity and big of in space complexity in this video we're just reviewing the t traversal algorithms if you want to understand or if you want to see the in details explanations if you want to see the details explanations please refer to the section binary tree thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to implement this search method let's see how we can implement this method this is the pseudocode of search method this method takes one parameter value inside here we're calling this method search with root and value and here we have the search method this method takes two parameter here current node and value if current node is equals to null then we're printing value not found and it will return null else if current node dot value equals to value then we'll print value found in bst and we'll return the current node if not we're checking if the value of current node is greater than value then we'll call the method search with the left subtree if not we'll call the method search with right subtree 
For example, if you're given this binary search tree, if we call this method search6, first we'll check with the root value. Does 8 equals to 6? We'll check 8 by this statement current node that value equals to value. We see 6 is not equals to 8. Then we're checking if the value of current node is greater than the given value. Yes, it is. Then we will move to the left subtree. We'll call with this node. In that case, we see that 6 is not equals to 3. And we see value of current node is not greater than the given value. So we'll call with the right subtree. In this case, we'll call with this node. Now we see the value of our current node is equals to the given value. So we'll print value found in BST and we'll return this node. Hope you've understood how search method works. You see that in order to search this value, we compare this value 6 with just three nodes, okay? We're not checking every single node. If we call this method again with 14, then what's gonna happen? First, we're gonna call with the root node and 14. And we see 14 is not equals to 8. And 8 is less than 14, so we'll call with this right subtree. 10 is not equals to 14, so we'll call with the right subtree. And then we found here 14. So we'll print a value found in BST. If we call this method with search 4, then we'll call this search method with current node and value current node is our root node initially. And we see 8 is not equals to 4, so we'll call it left subtree since the value is less than 8. Then we see 4 is not equals to 3, so we'll call with the right subtree. We see 6 is not equals to 4, we'll call with the left subtree since 6 is greater than 4. And here we see 4 is equals to 4, so we'll print the value found in BST. And here we see that we compare it with 4 nodes, we're not checking every single node. If we have a huge amount of nodes in, in a given binary search tree, then we don't have to check every single node to find out a value in a binary search tree. To find out a value in a binary search tree. If we call this method search with 20, now let's see what's gonna happen. We'll call this method search with 8 and 20. 8 is not equals to 20 and it is less than, so let's call it right. And here we see 10 is not equals to 20, let's call it right sub t. 20 is not equals to 14, so let's call it right, right is null. Whenever we found null node, as our current node, we'll print value not found and we'll return null. This is how it works. This is something like binary search. And binary search works exactly like this. Alright, hope you have hope you have understood how to search a value in a binary search tree efficiently. And this is why binary search tree came into the picture. We can search a value in a binary search tree in logarithmic time complexity. The time complexity is O log of n and the space complexity as well O log of n for the recursion call stack. Okay. Now, how we get this time complexity? If we break down every single line, we have to come, we have to compute the time complexity for the method search. Here n is the number of nodes we have in a given binary search tree. Here we're calling the binary search to the left part if not we're calling with the right part so in each step our t becomes small here we'll call with the left subtree or we'll call with the right subtree we'll not back to the right subtree or left subtree once we get to the left or right if we apply here back substituting method then we'll get this time complexity o log n and o of log n we have a section in this course, searching in searching sections, please check the video binary search. In binary search, we have talked about the back substituting method. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about delete node. So let's implement this method delete node for binary search tree. In the previous section of this course, we saw that how to delete a node from a binary tree. But this is a binary search tree where we have the value on the left subtree are less than and the value of the right subtree are greater than the parent node. Now let's see how we can implement this method. 
this is the pseudocode to delete node from a binary source t we're calling this method with root and value inside here we're checking if root equals to null we're printing value not found and we're returning null if the value of root node is greater than value then we're calling with left subtree if the value of root node is less than value then we're calling with right subtree if we find out the value in our binary search tree, then we have to delete the current node in that case we're gonna check if we have left and right child for our current node that we have to delete then we'll apply this formula else if if we see the current node has only left child then we'll apply this formula if our current node has right child then we'll apply this formula if the current node is a leaf node then we'll apply this formula root equals to null and here we'll return root this is the minimum method this method takes root of a given binary tree and this method will return the minimum node in a tree or you could say in a subtree for sake of understanding let's say we're given this binary search tree first let's see the intuition how we can delete a node let's say we want to delete this node a three then what we're going to do we're going to find the minimum value on the right subtree of this node three and that is four so we'll take this value and we'll update the value of this node three with the minimum value on the right subtree of this node three and then what we'll do we'll delete this node okay and it will set to null and now we see that this node three has deleted and we see that this binary search tree is a valid binary search tree after deleting the node three the left subtree of this node four is less than the right subtree of this node four is greater than this is how we will delete a desired node from a binary search tree let's say we want to delete the node eight this is a root node then what are we going to do we're going to find out the minimum value on the right subtree of this node eight and that is 10. so we'll update the value eight with 10 and then we'll delete this node 10 and we'll connect this node to this node 14 and we see that this is a valid binary search tree after deleting this root node the value on the right subtree are greater than the value on the left subtree are less than now let's see how we can delete a particular node from this binary search tree using this pseudocode if we call this method delete node 3 then we'll call this method with the root and with the value 3 by this method here we're checking if root equals to null root is not equals to null and here we're going to check this if condition rooted value 8 is greater than the given value so we'll call with left subtree now we will call this method with left subtree and with value 3 now we see 3 is equals to 3 so now we're at this else statement now we're gonna check does the node 3 has left and right child yes it has left and right child then what are we gonna do we're gonna find out the minimum node on the right of this node 3 and we'll set 10 variable to this root the minimum value on this right subtree is 4 how we can find that here we'll call this method minimum with temp dot right so we'll call this method temp dot right this method will return the node 4 by this method minimum this method minimum will return the node 4 so we'll update this value of this node 3 with 4 so let's update this value with 4 then we'll call this method with right dot root so we'll attach something to this right child or to this right pointer we'll call with 6 and 4 if we call with 6 and 4 we see 6 is greater than 4 so we'll call with left the left is this node 4 itself so we'll call it 4 and 4 now we see this is a leap node so we'll set this node as null since this is a root node by this root equals to null statement then we'll return the root this is our current root so this root will be returned to this function call root then we'll return the root now our current root is null since we have root equals to null so the null will set to the left of this node 6 so we'll set root dot left equals to null so we'll set this left child of this node as null then we'll recurse back in the previous recursive function call it will return the node 6 and the node 6 will be attached to the right child of our current root that is 
this node 4 we have updated with 4 the value of this node 3 with 4 so we'll attach this node 6 to the right child of this node 4 and that is already this node 6 and this is how we can delete a node from a binary source t hope you've understood how to delete a node from a binary source t and we take the minimum value from the right sub two of a desired node and we're updating the value with the minimum value on the right sub t and we're deleting the minimum value from the tree this is how we can delete a node from a binary search t now let's say we want to delete this node 8 now if we call this method delete node with 8 we want to delete the root node let's say we can delete that so we find out the so we have found the node that need to be deleted that is the root node now directly we're on this else statement here we see the root node has left and right child so what we're gonna do we're gonna set temp as this root we'll set temp variable to this root node and then we'll find out the minimum value on the right and that is 10 so let's update the value 8 with 10 now what we're gonna do we're gonna set the right of this node 10 so what is the right child of this node 10 we don't know right so we have to set the right child after deleting a desired node the binary search tree must follow the properties of binary search tree after deleting a desired node the tree must follow the properties of a binary search tree then we're going to call with root dot write with this node and value 10 here we have to delete this node okay if we call with 10 and 10 then we are again on this else statement here we see we don't have any left child so we have only right child so we'll set root equals to root dot right so we're gonna set here root equals to root dot right so this is our current root okay then we're gonna set here root equals to root dot right so we're gonna move this root to the next to the right child we're gonna move the root to the right child and at the end here we're returning the root so we'll return the root that means this node and this node will return to this root dot right that means to the right child of this node 10 so we'll attach this link to this node okay this node 4 so we have attached the link to this node 14 so in the previous recursive function call we'll attach the right pointer to this node 14 by skipping this node 10 all right and this is how we can delete this node and in the previous recursive function call will return this root node this is how we can delete a desired node from a binary search t maintaining the properties of binary search t hope you have understood how this method actually works hope you have understood this video explanation if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we are going to talk about delete binary search tree operation Let's say we're given this binary search tree. And this is the algorithm to delete binary search tree. If we invoke or if we call this method, then this root will set to null. Okay. So let's disconnect this root pointer. Root will set to null node. Now, garbage collector will automatically remove this node since there is nothing is pointing to this node 8. So this node will be removed by garbage collector. Now we see there is nothing is pointing to this root node. So this root node will be removed by garbage collector. Then we see that there is nothing is pointing to this node 3 and to this node 10. So this node 3 and 10 will be removed by garbage collector. Then we see that there is nothing is pointing to this node 1. So this will be removed by garbage collector. There is nothing is pointing to this node as well. There is nothing is pointing to this node as well. So this node 6 and this node 14 will be removed by garbage collector then this node 4 this node 7 this node 13 there is nothing is pointing to this node 4 7 and 13 so so the node 4 7 13 will be deleted by garbage collector so our enter binary search tree is deleted if we say root equals to null this is how this delete operation works this operation will take big of one time complexity and big of one space complexity hope you have understood this operation delete binary search tree thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video 
hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about a binary heap heap data structure is a complete binary tree that satisfies the heap property heap data structure also called binary heap now let's see heap properties value of any given node must be less than the value of its children and this is called mean heap and value of any given node must be greater than value of its children and this is called max if we have two types of heap one is mean if and the other one is max if binary heap is a complete tree it means that all levels are completely filled except possibly the last level and the last level has all keys as left as possible Hope you've understood what is a heap data structure. Now let's see some example. This is the definition of mean heap and this is the definition of max heap. This is an example of mean heap. Value of any given node must be less than the value of its children. So the value of this node 8 is less than the value of all the children. And the value of this node is less than the children. Value of this node less than the value of its children for this node the value of this node is less than of its children and these are called leaf node 55 65 16 50 and 60 these are all leaf nodes this is called mean if and this is an example of max if value of any given node must be greater than value of its children so value of this node is greater than of its children value of this node is greater than the value of its children value of this node is greater than of its children and value of this node 22 is greater than the value of its children and these are leaf nodes so we can say this is a max if hope you have understood what is a mean if and what is a max if now let's talk about application of a binary if binary if is used while implementing priority queue this express algorithm uses binary heap and heap short algorithm uses a binary heap. This is a sorting algorithm. We'll talk about this sorting algorithm in the sorting algorithm section of this course. This is all about this video. In the next video, we'll talk about binary heap implementation options. See you in the next video. In this video, we're going to talk about binary heap implementation option. We can implement binary heap using array or we can implement binary heap using linked list. We have these six standard operations that we can perform in a binary heap. Create heap, pick, extract, size, insert and delete heap. There is no problem when we implement the binary heap using array. But there is a problem when we implement binary heap using linked list data structure. For linked list data structure, this extract operations create a problem. This extract operation will take for linked list implementation linear time complexity. But for add implementation, this extract operation will take logarithmic time complexity. That's why we'll choose array based implementation of binary heap always. Is. We'll never use linked list implementation of binary heap. We have two types of heaps, mean heap and max heap. This is an example of mean heap and this is an example of max heap. If we extract this node 8, then what's going to happen? We'll remove this node, okay? And we will take the defaced node. That means the last node we get by traversing the binary heap using level order traversal. And this is the last node and we can update the value of this root node with this defaced node and then we'll remove the defaced node if we do this using linked list data structure that means if we implement binary heap using linked list data structure then the extract operation will take linear time complexity and that's not what we want we want to extract head node from binary tree in logarithmic time complexity when you implement binary heap using array data structure, we can get the last element easily using 
using a variable last used index or something like that. But for linked list implementation, we have to traverse the binary heap to get the last node or the defaced node. All right. And that's all we will see in this section of this course when we will implement extract operation. Hope you have understood why we should suit array based implementation instead of linked list based implementation. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey what's up guys welcome back to this video. In this video we are going to talk about binary heap data structure. In this video we are going to implement these two method create heap and insert. This method create heap will create the heap data structure and this insert method will insert data into binary heap. Now let's see how we can implement these two method. This is our class heap using array. Inside here we have array and we have a variable site this method create heap will takes the site as input inside here we're creating binary heap of site size plus one and then we're setting this variable size to zero if we call this method create heap with seven then we'll create an array of length eight where we have index from zero to seven and size is zero initially okay we'll not use our first cell for easy implementation we have no element in our array so we can consider our heap is null this method takes big of one time complexity and big of in space complexity where n is the length of the given array or we could say the size of our heap now let's talk about insert method this method takes one parameter value inside here we're inserting the value in our heap data structure then we're increasing the size and then we are calling this method heapify bottom to top with the side okay that means the index of our current inserted data into our heap we have here this formula left child equals to array 2x right child equals to array 2x plus 1 the value at index 1 is our root node and here x is the index number and if we insert 10 20 30 40 50 60 and 70 in our binary heap then our binary heap will be represented something like this and this is the representation of this array in computer memory we'll store the array logically the array will be represented as binary heap something like this this is the logical representation of our binary heap data structure this method will text big of log of in time complexity and big of log of in space complexity now let's talk about heapify bottom to top method and let's see how insert method works this is our heapify bottom to top method this method takes the this method takes the index as input and here we're checking if index is less than or equals to one then we're returning because we have only one node or we have no node then we have to do nothing then here we have to find out the parent node if we see the currently inserted node is less than the parent node then we have to swap them and then we have to call the heapify bottom to top until our currently inserted element gets the correct position in the binary heap no worry about that now we're going to see how it actually works if we call this method insert six then what we're going to do we're going to insert six right over here and we'll increase the site and we'll call this heapify method and we'll call this method heapify bottom to top with the index of six that is one and we see index equals to one so we'll return we will do nothing then let's call this method again with 4 so we'll insert 4 right over here and 4 will be assigned to the left child of this node 6 so 4 will be assigned right over here the array will be represented something like this using this formula the value at index 1 is root node and then left child equals to 2x and that is 2 now let's do heapify bottom to top if we call this method with the index of 4 that is 2 so let's find out the parent and the index of parent is 1 we get by dividing the index of 4 by 2 now we're going to compare the current node value and the parent node value and we see 4 is less than 6 so we're going to swap if we swap this two node then 4 will move at the place of 6 and 6 will move at the place of 4 and in our array we'll swap this two value so 4 will move here and 6 will move here and this is the representation of this array as binary heap 
we'll call the simplify method again with the parent that means the index one for the next recursive function call index equals to one so it will just return or it will just exit by this return statement then let's call this method again with five so let's insert here five right child equals to 2x plus 1 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3 so let's insert as right child right over here now let's call this hippify bottom to top method with index 3 and we see that the parent node is less than this current node so this if condition false we'll call with parent parent is 4 and index is 1 so it will just exit by this return statement then we're going to call this insert method again with one so let's insert as left child of this node six right over here two times two is four so we're going to insert here one now let's call this hippify bottom to top with the index four and we see that parent of one is six and six is greater than one so let's swap them one will move here and six will move here and here we'll swap one and six so six will move here and one will move here for the next recursive function call we'll call with the index 2 and we see the parent is of index 1 and we see parent is greater than the current node so let's swap them if we swap 4 and 1 4 will move here and 1 will move here and in our array we'll swap this 4 and 1 1 will move here and 4 will move here and we're done with this function call then we'll call with the index of root node that is one so we'll just exit by this return statement now let's call this method again with seven so seven will be inserted as the right child of this node four right over here and in your array right over here the index of four is two so two x plus one two times two plus one is five so at index five we have seven we have inserted here as right child seven now let's call the hippify bottom to top with index 5 and we see that 7 is in its correct position if we call this if statement evaluated false then we'll call with the index of this node 4 that is 2 and we see the parent of this node 4 is 1 of index 1 and 4 is in its correct position then we'll call with the index of root node that is 1 so we'll just exit by this written statement now we're done with this call insert 7 now let's call again with 2 so we're going to insert right over here too index of 5 is 3 3 times 2 is 6 so we'll insert 2 right over here and our binary heap will be represented something like this now let's call this hippify bottom to top with index 6 so the parent of this node 2 is this node 5 so 6 divided 2 is 3 so this node 5 now let's swap this 5 and 2 to move here and 5 will move here here we'll swap 5 and 2 so let's swap 2 and 5 now let's call this hippify method with the index 3 and we see that to it in its correct position then we'll call with the index of this root node and then we'll just exit by this return statement then if we call this method again with 3 so let's call with 3 and let's insert here 3 3 times 2 plus 1 is 7 so we have inserted as right child and we see 3 is in its correct position because 3 is greater than 2 we are done this is how we can construct a binary heap data structure this is the array and this is the representation of binary heap data structure logically okay this is the logical representation this method hippify bottom to top will take log of n time complexity and log of in space complexity for the recursion call stack hope you have understood this video explanation thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to implement this three method side peak and is empty now let's talk about that first we're going to talk about side this method takes no parameter and this method just written the side and the site is the index number that means the last used cell and that is 7 so for this given binary heap if we call this method site we have to written 7 if we call this method is empty we have to written false because this binary heap is full this binary heap is not empty 
if we see the size is zero or less than zero that means our binary heap is empty so if we call this is empty method we have to return false for this given binary heap if we call this method pick then we have to return 10 10 is the value of head node so if we return the value 10 we have to do nothing we have to just return it if we see the size is zero or less than zero then we have to print value doesn't exist this method size will take big up one time and big up one space complexity this method is empty also takes big up one time and big up one space complexity and this method pick as well will takes big up one time and big up one space complexity hope you have understood this video explanation if you have an issue understanding this video explanation, let us know. I have attached the source code to this video. Check that out. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we are going to talk about the method extract. Now, let's talk about this method extract. This extract method will return the value of head node and it will remove the head node from our heap data structure now let's see how we can implement this method extract this method is going to be a little bit difficult don't worry about that we'll talk about don't worry about that we'll talk about every single details of this method extract this is method extract this method takes no parameter inside here we're checking if size equals to zero then we're returning minus one returning minus one means the binary heap is empty then we're extracting the value extracted value equals to array one the value from index one then we're going to replace the value at index one with the deepest node okay that means the last node in our array then we're decreasing the side we're just skipping the last node that means the last element okay we're deleting the last element we're just skipping the last element then we're calling this epify top to bottom method with index one with the index of root node because we have updated the value of root node with the value of deepest node so we have to hippify the binary heap data structure after hippifying we'll return the extracted value after doing this hippify top to bottom after calling this hippify top to bottom method we're going to return extracted value this is the method if we find top to bottom this method takes the index that means the index of our root node then we're finding out the left and right child and then we have to find out the smallest child if we see size is less than left that means our current node has no child in that case we'll just exit by this written statement if we see current node has only left child then we'll compare the value with our left child if the value of our root node is greater than the left child then we have to swap if we see the value of our root node is greater than the value of our left child then we have to do a swap using this statement here okay temp equals to array index array index equals to array left and array left equals to temp if we see the current node has left and right child then we have to find it the smallest child if the left is less than right then you have to set left to smallest child variable else smallest child equals to right here we're not checking we're not checking the right child because if a particular node has a right child that means the node has two childs that means the node has two child left and right here we're checking if the valuable root node is greater than the value of smallest child then we have to do a swapping using this formula and then we're calling this and then we're calling this if if i top to bottom with the smallest child after doing the swapping here smallest child is the index number okay not the value of node this is index number now let's see how it works if we call this method extract for this given binary t then it will return 10 how let's see first we're going to check the size size is not equals to zero then we extracted the value from our root node that is 10 and then we're going to update this value with the value of deepest node then we're going to update the value of this root node with the deepest node deepest node is 7 that we're going to get by using the getting the last value from our array and that is 70 so let's update this value 
Now let's update this value 10 with 70. In our array, we'll update the value 70 right here. Here we'll not delete the last element, we'll just skip the last element. Then we'll decrease our size. Our size is now 6. So we'll just skip this node. So the right child of 30 is null. Then what we'll do, we'll do heavify. If we do heavify here, first we're going to check the left child. First we're going to check if the current node has no child. The current node has left and right child, okay? Now we're going to check if the current node has no child. This is false. Then we're going to check if the current node has only left child. No, this is also false. Then we're going to check if current node has left and right child. We see current node has left and right child. This is your current node 70. Since we have left and right child, we have to find it the smallest child. The smallest child is 20. Now we're going to check 70 and 20. We see 70 is greater than 20, so we're going to swap. If we swap, we'll update the value 20 with 70. And then we're going to update the value 70 with 20. So we have updated the value 70 with 20. And here we have updated the value 20 with 70. And in our array, what we're going to do, we're going to swap these two, 20 and 70. In our array, we're going to swap 20. So 20 will move here and 70 will move here. So 20 move here and 70 move here. So 20 goes here and 70 goes here. And this is just the logical representation of this array. Then we're going to call this method with the smallest child. Smallest child is this child 70. Smallest child store the index of this node 20. Now this node we have updated with 70. So we're going to call with the index 2. Now we see this node has two child left and right. The minimum is 40. Now let's swap 70 and 40 since 70 is greater than 40 using this formula. So let's swap them. 70 will move here and 40 will move here. And in our array, we're going to swap 70 and 40. So here we're going to update 40 with 70. And here we're going to update 70 with 40. So we've updated with the value 40 and here with the value 70. Now we're going to call this method again with the index of 70 that is 4. And in this case, we see that there is no left and right child of this node 70. So this if we fight top to bottom function call will exit by this written statement. So we have extracted the value 10 from our binary heap. And then we made this function call if we fight top to bottom. This is how this extract operation works. If we call this extract method again, in that case, it will return 20. And we'll update 20 with 60 and we'll remove 60 and then we'll just swap 60 and 30. Since 30 is the minimum child. And that is going to be easy. Now let's see how we can do that. Now if we call this method extract, then it will return 20. Now if we call this method extract again, then it will return 20. And then we're going to get the deepest node that is 60. In here 60 and we'll update 20 with 60. Here we'll update 20 with 60 and we'll remove 60 and we'll skip this element in the new side of our binary heap will be evaluated 5. Then we will call this method if we fight top to bottom. So in that case we'll find out the left and right child. So in this case we see that we have left and right child so the minimum is 30. Now let's swap. If we swap 30 and 60, 30 will move here and 60 will move here. Okay, if we call again this if we fight up to bottom with 6 to we see there is no left and right child. So this function call will just exit by this written statement. Then we're done. And here we're swapping 30 and 60. In our array first, we'll take 60 and we'll update this value 20 with 60. Then we'll just swap 60 and 30. 60 will move here and then 30 will move here. Okay. Hope you've understood how extract operation works. I have attached the source code to this video. Check the source code. This extract operation will take speak of log of n time complexity and it will also take speak of log of n space complexity for, for the recursive call stack. Hope you've understood this video explanation. If, if you have an issue understanding this video explanation, let us know. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. 
hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to implement this method delete if this is going to be super simple this method going to be super simple this is the method delete if it will takes no parameter inside here we're just setting array to now the array name is a pointer that points to the first cell to the array if we set array to null then the pointer will be changed to null the array name is the pointer to the first cell of the array so the array name is now pointing to null and there is nothing is pointing to the first cell we know the array is represented in contiguous fashion so the entire array will be deleted by garbage collector since we're implementing binary heap using array if we delete the array that means we're deleting the binary heap this is just the logical representation of the array hope you have understood this video explanation this method takes big of one time complexity big of one space complexity hope you have understood this video explanation if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about avl tree data structure avl tree is a self-balancing binary search tree in which is node maintains extra information called a balance factor whose value is either minus one zero or plus one balance factor of a node in an avl tree is the difference between the height of the left subtree and the height of the right subtree of that node in avl tree if the balance factor of a node is not minus one zero or plus one then the tree is not a real tree because that node is not following the properties of a real tree so the value of balance factor should always just be minus one zero or plus one balance factor equals to height of left subtree minus height of right subtree this is the formal definition of a real tree now let's see some examples this is an examples of a real tree we have balance factor for every single node the balance factor for this node 5 is 1 because the height of left subtree of this node is 2 this is the left subtree the height is 2 1 and 2 and the height of right subtree is 1 this is the right subtree so 2 minus 1 is 1 so the balance factor of this node 5 is 1 so this node is following the properties of avl tree then for this node the height of left subtree is 0, the height of right subtree is 1. So 0 minus 1 is minus 1. And this are leaf node for leaf node, the values 0 by default. Because for leaf nodes, there is no left and right subtree. Then for this node, the value is 1 because the height of left subtree is 0. 0 minus the height of right subtree is minus 1. Since there is no right subtree, so the value is minus 1. So the balance factor of this node 4 is 1. Then for this node, the left subtree is minus 1 and the right subtree is 0. So minus 1 minus 0 equals to minus 1. So the balance factor for this node 6 is minus 1. So we can say this is a valid AVL tree. Because the balance factor for every single node either minus 1, 0 or plus 1. Now let's see another example. This is an example of a real tree. We have calculated the balance factor for every single node. The balance factor for this node is 1. The height of left subtree is 2. Height of right subtree is 1. 2 minus 1 is 1. For this node, 1 as well. The height of left subtree is 1. The height of right subtree is 0. So 1 minus 0 is 1. Then for this node, 0. The height of left and right subtree, 0. So 0 minus 0 is 0. This are leaf node for leaf node the balance factor is zero and for this node the balance factor is zero. So we can say this tree is following the properties of AVL tree. And AVL tree is a binary search tree as well. If a tree do not following the properties of binary search tree, then we cannot say that tree is a AVL tree. Because AVL tree is a binary search tree where we have extra information and that is a balance factor the values on the left subtree is less than the values on the right subtree are greater than for every single node 
for this tree and for this tree. So we can say this true tree is a AVL tree. Hope you have understood what is AVL tree. Now you might ask why we need to learn AVL tree. That's a great question. In binary research tree, insertion operation takes linear time, deletion operation takes linear time. And search operation takes logarithmic time complexity. For AVL tree, insertion and deletion operation takes logarithmic time complexity. And search operation takes logarithmic time complexity as well. And this is similar to binary search tree. And here we see that for insertion and deletion operations, we can improve the time complexity from linear to logarithmic. That's a huge gain. And this is why AVL tree come into the picture. And this is why we should learn AVL tree. Using AVL tree, we can improve time complexity for insertion and deletion operations from linear time complexity to logarithmic time complexity. Hope you have understood why we should learn AVL tree. Now let's see the application of AVL tree. For indexing a large records in database set, we use AVL tree. And for searching in a large databases, we use this AVL tree. These are the two use cases, and there are many use cases of AVL tree. Hope you have understood what is AVL tree and why we should learn AVL tree. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next video. Hey, you what's up, guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to implement two methods create a VL tree and a source. Create a VL tree method will create a VL tree, and source method will search for a value in the AVL tree. Now let's implement this two method. We have calculated the balance factor for every single node. Okay? For this node balance factor zero, for this node minus one, for this node minus one, for this node minus one and zero for the leaf nodes. Now let's see create AVL tree method. This is class AVL tree. Inside here we have a node. The nodes of AVL tree contains four attributes value height and left and right pointer. Here we have the root of AVL tree and we have this method create AVL tree. This method takes no parameter. Inside this method we're just setting root to null okay this method will takes big o of in time complexity and big o of in space complexity here we have root of our avl tree then we have this method create avl tree this method takes no parameter inside here we're setting root to null and this method will takes big o of one time and big o of one space complexity now let's see this search method if a value exists in a given AVL tree, then it will return true. If the value do not exist, it will return false. Now let's talk about search method. The search method will take a value as input and it will return the node if the node exists in the AVL tree. If the node doesn't exist, it will return null. This is the algorithm for search method. This method takes one parameter value. Inside here, we're calling this search method with root and value this is our helper method this method takes two parameter node and value initially node is the root node and value is the given value inside here we're checking if node equals to null will return null this is base sketch else if if we find out the value then we'll return that node if we find out the current node value is greater than the value then we'll call with left subtree else we'll call with the right subtree if we call this method with a three First, we're going to call the search method with root 5 and value 3 for this given AVL tree. And we say that node is not null, node is 5, and the value of this node is not equals to 3, and we see the node value is greater than 3. So let's go to the left subtree. Now we're on the left subtree, and we see the value 2 is less than 3, so let's go to the right subtree. This is the right subtree. And here we find out the value 3. So we'll return this node a 3. So we'll return 3 for this function call. And this is how it works. Now let's call this method with 8. 
here we see 5 is not equals to 8 so let's go to the right subtree and here we see 7 is not equals to 8 so let's go to the right subtree and here we see 8 equals to 8 so we'll return this node 8 for this function call we'll return the node 8 this is how this search operation works and this search operation similar to the search operation for binary search tree we know that evil tree is a binary search tree where we have extra information called balance factor so the search operation will take logarithmic time complexity and logarithmic space complexity since we're dividing the avl tree into two halves for each recursive function call that's why it will take big of log in time complexity and big of log in space complexity for the recursive call stack hope you've understood create avl tree method and search operation thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to implement this insert method this method takes a value as input and it will insert the value to the avl tree this method is going to be a little bit harder to understand we have four types of rotation for inserting a value in avl tree left left rotation left right rotation right right rotation and right left rotation in this video we're going to talk about left left rotation when you are going to insert a value in avl tree then this process is going to be a little bit difficult to understand for inserting a value in avl tree we have four conditions left left condition left right condition right right condition and right left condition in this video we're going to talk about left left condition what is a left left condition and how left left condition works now let's talk about that in details for example if you're given this avl tree as input and we want to insert a value one and we have inserted the value one right over here since avl tree is a binary search tree correct position of one the left of this node two whenever we insert this value the avl tree is not following the properties of avl tree and that is the properties of balance factor all node should have a balance factor minus one zero or plus one but when you have inserted this value to this avl tree then the balance factor of this node one is zero the balance factor of this node two is zero minus minus one is one the balance factor of this node three is height of left sub three that is one one minus minus one that is two so this node is not following the appropriate balance factor the balance factor of this node is not minus one zero or plus one the balance factor is three so this two node is not following the properties of avl tree when you have inserted a value to the left subtree of a node then we have to handle left left condition now we have to do left left rotation to make this tree is a avl tree as well as a binary search tree in order to do that we have to do a right rotation here okay if we do right rotation then the t will be represented something like this two goes up and three goes to the right child of this node two and that will be represented something like this this is called left left condition let's take another example for example if you are given this avl tree as input and here we have inserted the node one right over here and now we see that the balance factor of this node two is zero minus minus one is one the balance factor of this node four is zero the balance factor of this node is one minus zero that is one the balance factor the balance factor of this node five is two minus zero the height of left subtree minus height of right subtree and that is two so this node is not following the properties of avl tree because the balance factor of this node is two not minus one zero or plus one and we see that the balance factor of this node five is not appropriate balance factor because the balance factor should be minus one plus one or zero the balance factor here we see is two so this is the culprit node 
the balance factor of this node 5 is 2. So here we have to do a, a right rotation. If we do a, a right rotation, then 3 will be represented something like this. And this is called left left condition. Now let's see how this left left condition works. This is the algorithm for inserting a value in a AVL tree. Here we have this helper method insert. This method takes a root and the value. This is the helper method. This method takes two parameter, node and value. Node is the root node initially. This is our base sketch. If we found node equals to null, then we are creating a new node and we are returning that node. If we found the current node value is greater than the given value, we will call with left subtree. Else we will call with right subtree. If not, we will just return that current node. And this is the properties for binary search tree. And this is binary search tree specific code. Here we have code for every specific task. After inserting the node to the correct position, after inserting a node to a appropriate position, then you have to calculate the height of a node. So node dot height equals to one plus the maximum height of left subtree and right subtree. And here we have this method height. We'll see this method in this video. Don't worry about that. This method takes the left subtree and right subtree and it will return the height of left and right subtree. And we'll get the maximum and we'll add to one. Then we have here balance factor. We'll call this method balance factor. This method will return the balance factor of a given node. And then we will check if the balance factor is greater than 1. Then if we found the value is less than node.lab.value. Then, then we have encountered left left condition. And in this video, we will see this left left condition. If not, if we find out the value is greater than node.lab.value, then we have to do here left right condition. In the left right condition, we have to call first left rotate, then we have to call right rotate. If the balance factor is less than minus 1, then we'll check this value if the value is greater than node dot right dot value then you have to do right right condition for right right condition we have to do left rotate if the value is less than node dot right dot value then you have to do here right left condition for right left condition we have to do first right rotate then left rotate and at the end we'll return our node in this video we'll see this left left condition now let's see how this left left condition works let's say we want to insert the node 1 to this AVL tree. So how we can insert this node 1 to this AVL tree? So we will apply this BST condition. Our current node is noted null and this value is less than 5 so let's go to the left. The value is less than 3 so let's go to the left. The value is less than 2 so let's go to the left. On the left we have encountered null node so we'll insert here this node 1 by this statement since the value is less than the node value. So we have created a new node with the value 1 by this return statement and we have inserted that node to the left of this node 2. Now this is our current node. Now let's find out the height of this node. The height of this node is 0 and the height of this right subject is minus 1. So maximum is 0 so 0 plus 1 is 1. So the height of this node is 1. And the balance factor of this node is 0 minus minus 1 and that is 1 as well. So the balance factor of this node 2 is 1. So we see that the balance factor is not greater than 1, is not less than minus 1. So we'll just return this node 2 to the left. So this node will be assigned to the left of this node 3. The balance factor of this node 3 is 1 minus minus 1. The height of right subtree is minus 1, so 1 minus minus 1 is 2. So this node is not contains the appropriate balance factor. So here we see that this balance factor is greater than 1. This method we'll see in our pseudocode. We can see this method in the source code. And here we see that the value is less than the node.lab.value. So node.lab.value is 2 and this value is less than this value 2. So here we find out the left left condition. And this is for left left condition if the, if the inserted value is less than the value on the left node of our current node. This is our current node where we find out the inappropriate balance factor. Now we have to do here right rotation. So we'll call right rotate method with this node. Here we have height of every single node. Now let's call right rotate with this node uh, 3. This is our pseudocode for right rotate. This method takes one parameter current node. 
Here we have current node equals to this node 3 and new node equals to this node 2, the left of our current node. Now current node dot left equals to current node dot left dot right. So we have to disconnect this, we have to set it to the right, the right of this right of this new node is null, so we have to set this left to null. Then new node dot right equals to current node. So here we will insert this current node. And then we'll calculate the height of current and height of new node. Height of new node is 1, the height of current node is 0. And here we see we have the height of this current node is 2. So we have calculated the height of this current node. Now we'll return this new node. And this new node will be inserted to the left of this node 5. So the new node will be inserted to the left of this 5. Then our binary tree will be represented something like this. Since we have calculated the height of this current node that is 0 by this formula, height of current node that is left is null, right is null, so th the value is 0, we can find out height of a node using this method height. The value of this current node is 0. Alright, now we see that this is a AVL tree, this is a binary search tree as well. And this is how we can insert a value in a AVL tree. And this process is going to be a little bit critical to understand, but don't worry. We have explained every bit of information that you need to understand this problem. And this operation will take a logarithmic time complexity. And the time complexity for right rotate and height is constant. These two methods work in constant time and in constant space complexity. And the overall time and space complexity for this insert method is logarithm. That is big O of log of n. Now let's see another example. Now let's say we're given this AVLT. We have to insert the node 1. So we inserted this node 1 right over here by this BST condition. Okay. Then we have to find out the balance factor for every single node. Let's find out the height. If we find out the height of every single node, the height of this node 2 is 1, for this node 3 is 2, and so on. The balance factor of this node 1 is 0, the balance factor of this node is 1, 0 minus minus 1 is 1, the balance factor of this node is 0, the balance factor of this node is 1 minus 0, that is 1, the balance factor of this node is 2 minus 0, that is 2. So here it's created a problem. This node is not contains the appropriate balance factor. Now we see that this condition is true for this root node. Balance factor is greater than 1 and the inserted value is less than the value on the left of our current node. This is your current node where we have find out the inappropriate balance factor that is our current node. Now let's check this value, the node dot left dot value. The value on the left of this node is 3. So 3 is greater than the value we have inserted. So we have to do here a right rotation since this is a left left condition. Since the value on the left of our current node is greater than the inserted value. So this is a left left condition. Now let's do a right rotation. This is our pseudocode for right rotation. This method takes one parameter current node and we have here current node and new node. Now let's apply this formula current node dot left equals to current node dot left equals to current node dot left dot right. So current node dot left equals to current node dot left dot right. So here we'll insert this node 4. We'll connect to this node. So the left of current node is this node 4. Then new root dot right equals to current. So here on the right of this new what we'll insert, we'll insert the node 5. And on the right of 5, we have the node 7. Then the tree will be represented something like this. First 3, on the left 2, on the left 1, then on the right is 5. On the left of 5, we have 4. And on the right of 5, we have already 7. Then we have to calculate the height of this node 5 and the height of this new node 3. So this is the representation of our AVL tree after doing this right rotation. Then our 
AVLT will be represented something like this. Now let's calculate height of current node and height of this the height of this new root node. So one plus max of left and right that is two. Then here one plus max of left and right that is, is one. And this is how we can insert a value in a AVL tree. And here we have to do this right rotation for this left left condition. And this is the statement for left left condition. And this is the if statement for left left condition when you have value when you have inserted values less than the value on the left of our current node. Current node is the first inappropriate node where we have invalid balance factor. Recursing back, inserting a node. Hope you have understood this method and this left left condition. This operation will take logarithmic time complexity and logarithmic space complexity. This these two method will take constant time complexity. Get balance factor also takes constant time and space complexity. And the overall time complexity for this insert method is big of log of n and the space complexity is big of log of n for the recursive call stack. Hope you have understood this video explanation. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next video.
Hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about rotation when you insert a node in a wheel tree then the tree can be disbalanced to solve this issue we have to do rotation we have four types of condition for rotation left left condition left right condition right right condition and right left condition now let's see what is left left condition what is left right condition and so on now first let's talk about left left condition for left left condition left left node of the current node is causing the disbalance to solve this problem we have to do right rotation if we are given this tree if we insert this node 1 to this avl tree then which nodes creates the problem so first let's find out the current node so after inserting this node to the left of 2, we have to recurse back, okay? For now let's calculate the balance factor. So 0, minus, minus 1. The balance factor for this node 1 is the left child is minus 1, the right child is minus 1. So the balance factor of this node is 0. The balance factor of this node 2 is 0, minus, minus 1, that is 1. The balance factor of this node 3 is 1 minus minus 1 that is 2 so this is the current node because this is the first node what we find out in appropriate balance factor when we're recursing back that means we are going back to our recursive function call here we see the left left node of this current node is creating the problem this is the node creating the problem so to solve this issue we have to do a right rotation if we do right rotation then it will be our new head if we do right rotation, the tree will be represented something like this. And this tree is balanced. And this is a valid AVL tree. This is called left left condition because the left left node of current node is causing the problem or is causing the disbalance. Now let's take another example for left left condition. Let's say we're given this AVL tree and we have inserted the node 1 to the left up 2. Now let's find out the balance factor. So balance factor of 1 is 0, the balance factor of 2 is 0 minus minus 1 that is 1, the balance factor of this node 3 is 1 minus 0 that is 1, the balance factor of this node 5 is 2 minus 0 that is 2. So this is the first node where we find out inappropriate balance factor. When you are recursing back that means when you are going back to our previous recursive function call. Now let's find out the left and left node of this node 5. So left is 3, the left of 3 is 2. So this node is creating the problem. To solve this problem, we have to do a right rotation. If we do right rotation, then 2 will be our root node. A wheel tree will be represented something like this. And this is valid a wheel tree. And this is called left left condition. Hope you have understood what is a left left condition. Now let's talk about left right condition. For left right condition, left right node of current node is causing this balance. In that case, first step to do left rotation, then you have to do right rotation. If we're given this AVL tree and here we have inserted 3. Now let's find out balance factor. Balance factor of 3 is 0. Balance factor of this node 2 is minus 1, minus 0. That is minus 1. Balance factor of this node 4 is 1 minus minus 1, that is 2. So this is our current node. How do we find out? Inappropriate balance factor. That is not minus 1, 0 or plus 1. Here we see the left of 4 is 2, the right of 2 is 3. And here we see that this node is creating the problem. And here we see that this node 3 is creating the problem. So let's do a left rotation first if we do left rotation in between these two node the left rotation then our tree will be represented something like this now we have to do here right rotation if we do right rotation then our tree will be represented something like this and this is valid avl tree and this is called left right condition hope you have understood what is a left right condition for left right condition we have to do first left rotation then right rotation now let's talk about right right condition 
for a right right condition right right node of current node is causing this valence in that case we have to do left rotation if we're given this avl tree and here we have inserted the node 8 now let's find it the balance factor balance factor of 8 is 0 the balance factor of 1 is minus 1 minus 0 is minus 1 the balance factor of 6 is 0 minus minus 1 that is 1 the balance factor of this node 6 is 0 minus 1 that is minus 1 the balance factor of this node 4 is 0 minus 2 that is minus 2 so this is the current node now who is not creating the problem the right right node of this node 4 is creating the problem the right right node the right right node of this node 4 is 7 the right of 4 is 6 right of 6 is 7 so this node is creating the problem so we have to do here a left rotation if we do here a left rotation then this node 6 will be our root then this node 6 will be the root of rotated tree so if we do left rotate then we'll get this avl tree and this is a valid avl tree and this is called a right rate condition hope you have understood what is a right rate condition now let's talk about right left condition for right left condition the right left node of current node is causing this valence in that case first you have to do right rotation then you have to do left rotation if we were given this avl tree would have inserted the node 6 here we have inserted this node 6 now let's find out balance factor the balance factor of this node is 0 the balance factor of this node 7 is 0 minus minus 1 that is 1 the balance factor of this node 5 is minus 1 minus 1 that is minus 2 so this is our current node the right left of this node 5 is 6 the right is 7 the left is 6 so this node is creating the problem first we have to do here a, a right rotation if we do right rotation then we will get this tree now we have to do here left rotation if we do left rotation then we will get this tree and this is valid avl tree and this is called right left condition for right left condition we have to do first right rotation then we have to do left rotation hope you've understood what is left left condition what is left right condition what is right right and what is right left condition in the next video we'll insert a node to a avl tree and we have to do rotation and we'll see all types of rotation and also we'll see all conditions okay thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video
Hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about insert operation and in this video specifically we'll talk about left right condition now let's talk about left right condition in details for a second point of studying let's assume we're given this avail tree and we have to insert a node of value 3 if we inserted this node to this avail tree this node will go to the right of this node 2 since this is a binary search tree because avail tree is a binary search tree and we have calculated the height of every single node. Now let's find out the balance factor. Balance factor of this node 0. The balance factor of this node 3 is 0. The balance factor of this node 2 is minus 1 minus 0. That is minus 1. There is no node on the left subtree. So the height of left subtree is minus 1. So minus 1 minus 0 is minus 1. Then here 1 minus minus 1 that is 2. So this is inappropriate node. Because this node is not following the properties of avl tree. The balance factor is not minus 1, 0 or plus 1. The balance factor is 2. Here we see the inserted value is 3. The value on the left of our current node where I find out the inappropriate balance factor 2. And that is less than the inserted value. So we have to do here left rotation. First we have to do left rotation. So let's do a left rotation. If we do left rotation. If we do here a left rotation, then our ability will be represented something like this. For left right condition, we have to do now a right rotation. If we do right rotation, then our ability will be represented something like this. And this is the valid ability where we have every single node contains appropriate balance factor. So this is the ability that we have to return. And this is called left right condition. For left right condition, first we have to do left rotation, then right rotation. Now let's see how this actually works using pseudocode. This is our pseudocode. The pseudocode exactly the same. The pseudocode in the previous video. For sake of understanding, let's assume we're given this AVL tree. And we have to insert a node 3. So the node 3 will go to the right of this node 2. Now let's find out the height of every single node and the balance vector of this node the balance vector of this node 3 is 0 balance vector of this node is minus 1 minus 0 is minus 1 now the balance vector of this node 4 is 2 because 1 minus minus 1 that is 2 now we find out this culprit node this node is not contains the appropriate balance factor that is 0 minus 1 or plus 1 this node contains the balance factor 2 now here we have to do left right condition first let's call with the left of this node 4 that is 2. Let's call with this node by left rotation and the returning node will assign to the left of this node 4 by this statement. Now let's see this left rotation. This is our left rotation pseudo code. Here we have current and new node. And here we have current node and new root. Now what do you have to do? Current node dot right equals to current node dot right dot left. So current node dot right is this node the left is null so we have to insert to the right of current node is null node then we have to say new node dot left equals to 2 so on the left we will assign the node 2 we will return this new node and that node will be assigned to the left of this node so the node 3 will be assigned to this node 4 then our tree will be represented something like this so we are done with this statement node.left equals to left rotate node.left. Let's call with this node. Now we have to do a right rotate. So this is our current node. So let's call with this node for a right rotate. We have to do here right rotate. For right rotation, this is our pseudo code. This is current and this is new root. Current.left equals to on the left. We have to assign current node.left.right. So on the right of this left of current is null so let's insert here null node and new root dot right equals to current that is 4 and here we'll return this new root this new root will be assigned to the left of this node 6 when you call with node dot left equals to insert node dot left with the value then our tree will be represented something like this and we have calculated the height of new node and current node using this formula and then we'll return this to the left of this node 6. And this is our root node and we'll return this node to this 
main function call. And this is how we can insert a value in a AVL tree. This is called left right condition. First step to do left rotation, then you have to do right rotation. Hope you've understood left right condition. This solution takes logarithmic time complexity and logarithmic space complexity. Hope you have understood this video explanation. If you have an issue understanding this video explanation, let us know. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about insert operation. Specifically in this video, we're going to talk about right right condition. And let's talk about what is a right right condition. Let's say we're given this ability where we've inserted the node 8. So 8 will go to the right of this node 7. And we have calculated the height of every single node. Now let's find out the balance factor. The balance factor of this node 8 is 0. The balance factor of this node minus 1, minus 0 is minus 1. The balance factor of this node is 0 minus 1. That is minus 1. Then the balance factor of this node 4 is 0 minus 2. That is minus 2. So this is our culprit node. This node is not contains appropriate balance factor. So this is the culprit node. This is a right right condition. Why this is a right right condition? The inserted value in this binary tree is 8. Current node is the first node. What you find out? Inappropriate balance factor when you recurse back. So value is 6. We see here this value is greater than right value of our current node. For right right condition, we have to do left rotation. If we do left rotation, then our tree will be represented something like this. In this tree, every single node contains appropriate balance factor that is 0, minus 1 or plus 1. And here we're just showing the a height of every single node. So height of this node 6 is 2, height of this node is 1 and so on. Now let's see how this actually works. And this is called left rotation. When you find out a right right condition, you have to do left rotation. This is our pseudocode as we saw in the previous slide. Now let's say we want to insert the value 8 to this AVL tree. So 8 will goes right over here and let's calculate the height. We find out the height. So the balance factor of this node 8 is 0. Balance factor of this node is minus 1, minus 1, minus 0 is minus 1. The balance factor of this node is 0, minus 1, that is minus 1. Balance factor of this node is 0, minus 2, that is minus 2. So here we find out inappropriate balance factor. So it will hit this condition. Minus 2 is less than minus 1. And here we see right right condition, the value 8 is greater than the value of right node of our current node. Current node is the node where we find out the inappropriate balance factor when it recursing back. So let's do a left rotation. This is the pseudocode for left rotation. So this is our current node, this is our new root. Now current node dot right equals to current node dot right dot left. So we'll insert to the right of 4 this node 5. Let's disconnect this and then new root dot left equals to current node. So the left will connect to this node. Then we have to calculate the height of current and height of this new root node. Then we'll return the new root node. Then our tree will be represented something like this. And let's calculate the height of this current node and the height of new root node. And here we see we have the value for every single node. And if we calculate the value of current node, we get max of left and right. Max of left and right is 0 and 0. So if we calculate the height, max of left and right plus 1, that is 1. Max of left and right, that is 1 plus 1, and that is 2. Now if we apply the value from this tree, we have this value. Now, now if we calculate the height, then we get height of current is 1, height of new root is 2. And that's remain the same. And at the end, we'll return this new root node. We'll return this new node, and here, this function will return this new node by this written statement to this function call. Get balance factor, let rotate, and height method will works in constant time and constant space complexity. We're not showing this method get balance factor this is super simple we have in the source code 
If you want to see this method, take a look at the source code. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about insert operation in AVL3 specifically in this video we're going to talk about 
the last condition right left condition for example if you're given this avl3 and we have to insert the node 6 we have inserted the node 6 to the left of this node 7 since avl3 is a binary search tree as well the inserted node value is 6 the balance factor of this node 6 is 0 balance factor of this node 7 is 0 minus minus 1 that is 1 the balance factor of this node is minus 1 minus minus 1 that is 2 so we find out inappropriate balance factor for this node now the right of this current node this is your current node because this is the node where we find out the inappropriate balance factor when we are recursing back so the value on the right is 7 we see the inserted value is less than the value 7 so this is right left condition first we have to do right rotation then we have to do left rotation if we do right rotation to this avl tree then we get this tree the inappropriate balance factor we find out at this node 5 now we have to do left rotation for this right left condition that's to left rotate so we get this avl tree and this is valid avl where every single node contains appropriate balance factor balance factor of this node 5 is 0 balance factor of this node is 0 of this node 6 is 1 of this node 4 is 0 minus 1 that is minus 1 and for this node is 0 so this is a valid avl tree now let's see how this right left condition works in pseudocode this is the pseudocode that we saw in the previous video now let's insert a node 6 to this a tree so 6 will go to the left of 7 now let's find out the balance factor balance factor of this node 6 is 0 balance factor of 7 is 1 balance factor of 5 is minus 1 minus 1 so minus 2 it's hit this condition and here it masks this else if statement so let's do right rotate with this node 7 here we have calculated the height of every single node and this is our right rotate okay first step to do right rotate with the right node this is your current so if we do right rotate this is our new root node current node dot left equals to current node dot left dot right and that is null so on the left we'll insert null so on the left we'll insert a null node then new root dot right equals to current so on the right we'll insert this node 7 and we'll return this node then we'll calculate height of current and new node and then we'll return this new node and this new node will be attached the right of this node 5 then our tree will be represented something like this let's calculate the height the height of this node 6 is 1 height of this node 7 is 0 and so on so we're done with this statement now let's do left rotation with this node because this is our current node where we find out inappropriate balance factor if we do left rotate this is our left rotate pseudocode all right this is current and this is new root current node dot right equals to current node dot right dot left on the left of six is null so here we'll insert null on the right let's insert here null the new root dot left equals to on the left we're going to insert current that is five here we'll insert five and then we'll calculate height of current and new node and then we're going to return this node and this node will be attached to the left of this node 4 and this will be done by this statement node right and our tree will be represented something like this and here we have calculated the height of 6 and height of 5 0 and 1 this is how this right left condition works hope you have understood what is a right left condition for right left condition first you have to do right rotate then you have to do left rotate Hope you have understood this video explanation and the four conditions left left condition left right condition right right condition and right left condition this is all about insertion operation in avl tree after inserting a node if the balance factor evaluated minus one zero or one when you're recursing back that means we have to do no rotation in that case when you find out inappropriate balance factor when we're recursing back after inserting a node then we have to do rotation we have here four type of rotation and we have talked about in this video the last type of rotation right left condition
the rotation for right left condition the time complexity for this operation is log of n and the space complexity is log of n as well hope you have understood this video explanation thanks for watching i will see you in the next video hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about delete operation this method takes a parameter value as input and it will delete the node of the given value from avl3 for deleting a node from avl3 we might need to do rotation we might have to rotate the avl3 if we delete a particular node the balance vector may be changed and that's why we have to do rotation after deleting a node if we see the balance factor is valid then we have to do no rotation for deleting a node from avl3 we might have four condition left left condition left right condition right right condition and right left condition we have to rotate the avl3 if we find out inappropriate balance factor for a node if we find out appropriate balance factor for every single node after deleting a node then we have to do no rotation we don't have to worry about rotation okay now let's see how to delete a node from a wheel tree and we will see this four condition first let's talk about left left condition for left left condition the left left node of current node is causing this balance in that case we will do right rotation let's say we're given this avl3 and we want to delete this node 5 if we delete this node 5 then we will get this a tree and the balance vector of this node 1 is 0 the balance vector of this node 2 is 0 minus minus 1 1 the balance vector of this node 1 minus minus 1 and that is 2 so this is our current node the left left node that is this node is creating the problem so you have to do right rotation if we do right rotation then to be our the root of a tree so if we right rotate then we'll get this tree and this is a valid avl tree and this is called left left condition now let's talk about left right condition for left right condition the left right node of current node is causing this balance in that case you have to do first left rotation and right rotation let's say we're given this avl3 and we want to delete this node 5 if we delete this node 5 then our tree will be represented something like this and the balance vector of this node 3 is 0 the balance vector of this node 2 is minus 1 and the balance vector of this node 4 is 1 minus minus 1 that is 2 so this is your current node the left right node is 3 this node is creating the problem so first we have to do here a left rotation if we do left rotation then the t will be represented something like this and then we have to do right rotation if we do right rotation then 3 will be the root of rotated a tree so if we do right rotation then we'll get this tree and this is a valid avl tree and this is called left right condition hope you've understood what is a left right condition now let's talk about a right right condition for right right condition right right node of current node is causing this balance let's say we're given this tree and we want to delete this node three if we delete this node three then we'll get this tree now let's find out the balance factor balance factor of this node six is zero the balance factor of this node the balance factor of this node five is minus one minus zero that is minus one there is no left subtree that's why we have minus one for left subtree the balance factor for this node four is minus one minus one so the balance factor of this node four is two so this is our current node the right right node this is the right right node and this node is creating the problem so let's do here a left rotation if we do left rotation then we'll get this a tree and this is a valid avl tree and this is called right right condition if we have understood what is the right right condition because the right right node of current node is causing this valence now let's talk about right left condition for right left condition right left node of current node is causing this valence in that case first you have to do right rotation then you have to do left rotation let's say we're given 
this avl3 and we want to delete this node 3 if we delete this node 3 then we get this tree and the balance factor of 7 is 0 the balance factor of 6 is 0 minus minus 1 or 1 the balance factor of this node 4 is minus 1 minus 1 that is minus 2 so the right left node is creating the problem so let's do first the right rotation if we do right rotation then the tree will be represented something like this then we have to do left rotation if we do left rotation then our tree will be represented something like this and you see this is a valid avl tree the balance factor of this node 4 is 0 balance factor of this node 7 is 0 the balance factor of 6 is 0 as well so we can say this is a valid avl tree and this is called right left condition here the right left node of current node is creating the problem in that case we have to do right rotation and left rotation as we saw so this is the four condition we have to handle for deleting a node if we find out the balance factor is valid after deleting a node then we have to do no rotation and there is our base case now let's see the pseudocode this is the pseudocode to solve this problem we have this method delete node it takes a parameter value then we are saying here root equals to delete node and it takes root and value this is our helper method here we are checking if current node equals to null then we are returning null if value is less than the value of current node then we are calling with left subtree if the value is greater than the value of current node then we are calling with right subtree if we find out a node that we have to delete then we will apply this code and we have already talked about how to delete a node from a binary search tree and this is exactly similar to that and this is exactly same as deleting a node from binary search tree if current node has two child then we will apply this code if current node has only left child then we will apply this code if the current node has only right child then we will apply this code if the current node is left node then we will say just current node to null and we will return the current node and here this code is for avl specific works and this code for avl tree okay first here first we are calculating the balance factor for our current node if we find that balance factor is greater than one then we will apply this code and here we have left left condition and left right condition if we see balance factor is less than minus one then we might have right right condition or right left condition okay and here we're just calculating the height and at the end we're returning the current node here we have this helper method min node this method will find out a minimum node to a given subtree or to a given tree and this is for right rotation this is for left rotation and this is for calculation of a height of a node for left left condition if we apply the code to this tree and here we want to delete this node 5 then our tree will be represented something like this first we'll delete this node and then we'll do right rotation then we'll get this avl tree this is for left left condition now let's see for left right condition for left right condition if you want to delete this node then we get this tree then here we have to do left rotation after doing left rotation and uh, right over here after doing left rotation we have to do right rotation then we'll get this avl tree and this is called left right condition now let's talk about right right condition if we are given this avl tree if we want to delete this node 3 if we delete this node 3 then we get this tree and here we have to do left rotation here we have to apply this code okay then we'll get this avl tree now let's talk about right left condition if we're given this avl tree if we want to delete this node 3 and if we delete this node 3 we get this tree and here we have to do right rotation using this formula first right rotation then left rotation after doing right and left rotation we get this avl tree and we'll return this tree and this is how this four condition works if you want to see how this works I will highly encourage you to go through the pseudocode. I'm not going to go through line by line of code. I would highly encourage you to try to write out everything on a piece of paper so it will be cleared. Here, this method will take 
logarithmic time complexity. So the time and space complexity for this delete node is big of log n. If you have understood this video explanation, if you have any question understanding this video explanation, let us know. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next video. Hey, you what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about delete entire AVL tree. Now, let's see how we can implement this method, delete entire AVL tree. This is the method, delete entire AVL tree. This method takes no parameter. Inside here, we're setting root to null. This root pointer is points to the root of our AVL tree. If we set it to null, then it will be disconnected from this node and then it will point to null node. Null means nothing. Now here we see that there is nothing is pointing to this node 5. So garbage collector will remove this node from computer memory. Then you see there is nothing is pointing to this node 2 and to this node 7. So this 2 node will be removed by garbage collector. Then we see there is nothing is pointing to this node 1, to this node 3, to this node 6 and to this node 8. So this 4 node will be removed by garbage collector from memory. So let's remove them. Now we see that there is nothing is pointing to this node. There is nothing is pointing to this node 9. So this 2 node will be removed by garbage collector. Now we see our entire AVL tree has been deleted from computer memory. This is how delete enter AVL tree method works. We have to set root to null. If we set root to null, the entirety will be deleted automatically by garbage collector. So if we call this method, the entirety will be deleted by garbage collector. And the time and space complexity for this method is big of 1 and big of 1. So this method works in constant time and constant space complexity. Hope you have understood how we can delete enter AVL tree. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey you what's up guys. Welcome back to this video. In this video we are going to talk about try data structure. What is try? Try data structure is typically used to store and search strings in space and time efficient way. Every node in try data structure store non-repeating character. We'll talk about that in some time. No worry about that. Every node stores a link of next character and every node keep track end of a string. This is an example of try data structure. We have inserted here ABC, ABZL and LMN. Here we have inserted these three strings in this try data structure and the try is represented something like this. Every single node in try data structure store non-repeating character. Here we have two repeating character. Here we see we have AV and AV. But we have here A and B, okay? So we're not repeating the character. And every node store the link of next character. So here A and B. So here this node A stores the link of this next character B. And here M as well. This node contains the link of this character m as well and every node keep track end of a string so here we're not showing the end of string we'll talk about in details in this section of this course don't worry about that in try data structure we can make four standard operation insert then prefix search then search and then delete operation using this insert operation we'll insert words in our try data structure using prefix search we'll see if a certain prefix exist in our a try then we will search for a complete word and then we will delete a word from our try data structure and we will see all the operations in this section of this course now let's see the application of try data structure why should you learn try there are thousands of applications of try data structure in our real life now we're going to talk about two common uses spelling checker uses a try data structure this is an example of spelling checker. Here we see brwn. Here this is a mistake. Using a try data structure, we can fix this mistake something like this. So spelling checker uses try data structure. Google uses try for auto search suggestions. Google may use more advanced techniques, but the concept remains the same. Here we see we entered Google SEA and it gives us the suggestions. And they're using try data structure. Google may use more advanced features, 
but the core principles remain the same. Hope you've understood why you should learn tri data structure and what is a tri data structure. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about how tri data structure is represented. This is tri node. This node has two attributes child and end of word. This child is a hash map. This is the tri node. We have a hash map. This is a hash map. This is a hash map. And this is end of words. Okay, we have two parts hash map and end of words for each node. Now let's see how try is represented. Let's say we want to insert these three strings ABC, ABZ, and LMN. If we insert these three strings into our try data structure, then our try data structure will be represented something like this. A, B, C, A, B, Z, then L, M, N. And this is our try node. We have a hash map and we have a variable end up word. Now let's see how this try data structure is represented in computer memory. The try data structure is represented something like this. This is our root node. Here we have A and L. Here we're storing character and try node. Here we're storing character as key and try node as a value. So we have this. So we have here this character A and this pointer is points to this node. And here this node contains B and here we see the value for B is pointing to this node. And here we see we have two key C and G and the value of C is pointing to this node and the value of Z is pointing to this node. By this node, we're indicating that the word end with C and the word end with Z because here we have a true. And here we have false. False means this is not the end of the word. And here we have L M N. And here we have true. That means N is the last character. Okay. And here we have C and G. C is the last character of a word and G is the last character of a word since we have here true. And the value of this for C and G key. We have these two nodes and where we have end of word equals to two. That means we have a complete word that's end with C and G. And here we have a complete word that's end with N. This is how try data structure is represented in computer memory. And this is just a representation of try. And this is how it's represented. Hope you have understood how try data structure is represented. Here one important things that we're not storing the multiples a we have a b but we're storing only one a we have v and here we're just storing only one b okay so a b c is a word a b g is a word and l m n is a word hope you have understood this video explanation if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to implement this operation insert. This method will insert word in a try data structure. Now let's see how this method actually works. This is source code. This method takes one parameter word. Inside here, we're creating a pointer current that will point to root node. And then we're iterating the given word from left to right. Then we're getting our current character using this formula word.charat i and then we're creating a try node node and we're getting here current.child.get c8. If our current character does not exist in our current node, then this node will be evaluated null. If the node evaluated null, then we'll insert the current character to our current node and we'll also insert a new try node key as character and new try node as value and then we will change current pointed to the current node and then we will set at the end of this for loop we will set current dot end of word equals to true now let's see how this actually works don't worry about it if you're not understanding initially we have this root node and here we're assigning this current pointed to this root node so current and root pointer is pointing to this node and here we have nothing by default, we have end of word equals to false. 
and we have this empty hash map. Let's say we call this method with abc. In this string abc, our current character is a. Now we're going to check does the current character exist in this hash map. We see a is not exist in this hash map. So current dot child dot get a it will return null. So current dot child dot get ch it will be evaluated null. So we see that node equals to null. Now what we're going to do we're going to create a new node, and we're going to insert the character and the new node right over here. So we have inserted here a, and as value we're going to insert this node. Then in the next iteration we have this character b. And here by default we have false. Here we have by default false. And our current pointer will point to this blank node. Now our current character is b and we see b is not exist in this current node. So we're gonna insert here b and a new node. So let's insert here new node and b. Something like this. Now this current pointer will point to this blank node. Now our current character is c. We see c is not exist in our current node, so let's insert here c and a new node as value, something like this. And here we have value equals to false. Now let's move current to this node. And in the next iteration of this for loop, we're out of this string boundary. So we're gonna set current dot end of or equals to true. So we're gonna change this false to true. This is how we can insert a word to a try data structure. Now, if we call this method insert with abz, let's see how we can insert this in our try data structure. Our current node is this node, okay? And this is our root node as well. Now, our current character is a. We see a is exist in our current node, so we'll do nothing. Let's move current to the next node. This is our next node. Now, let's move current to this node. We see that our current character is b, b is exist in this node. So nothing need to be done here. Let's move current to this node. And our current character is z. We see z is not exist in this node. So let's insert g and a new node as value. So we have inserted here g and new node as value. And our current, and we'll move our current to this node. Then in the next iteration of this for loop, we're out of this string boundary. So we'll set current dot end of or equals to true. So we'll change this false to true. This means that we have two words abc and abz. That's a complete word. We have here two words abc and abz. These two are complete words we have in this try data structure. Now let's call this method with lmn and this is your current node. We see our current character l is not exist in our root node. So let's insert here l and as value new node. And let's move current to this node. And our current character is m. m is not exist in our current node. So let's insert here m and as value a new node something like this then our next character is n and let's move current to this node and our current character is here n here you see n is not exist in this node so let's add here n and as well a new node something like this let's move current to next and then in the next iteration of this follow we're out of this string boundary so let's change this false to true by this statement so we have inserted here this word l m n and this is a complete word. This is how we can insert words in a try data structure. And this is how insert operation works. Hope you have understood insert operations. This operation will take big of in time complexity, and this operation also takes big of in space complexity, where n is the length of the given string. Hope you have understood this video explanation. If you have an issue understanding this video explanation, let us know. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to implement this method prefix search this method takes one parameter this method will return true if the prefix exists in the try data structure otherwise it will return false now let's see how we can implement this method prefix search for sake of understanding let's say we're given this try data structure this is our algorithm this method takes one parameter prefix Inside here, we're creating a pointer current that will point to the root node. Then we're running a for loop for i from 0 to the length of a given prefix. Inside here, we're getting the current character from prefix. And then we're checking if the 
current character exists in your current node. If this node evaluated null, that means the current character doesn't exist in our try data structure. So we will return false. If the current character is found in our try data structure, then we will move our current pointer to the node. If we get to the end of the prefix and if we see this if condition never evaluated true, we'll just return true. That means our prefix is exist if this return statement get executed. Now let's see how it works. Let's say we call this method prefixers with a b. First our current pointer will point to this root node and our current character is a. We see a is exist in this node. So node is not evaluated null. We will move current to the node. The node is this node okay. So we will move our current pointer to this node right over here. In the next iteration we have the character b. We see the character b is exist in this node. This node pointer will point to this node and we see that node is not null. So we will move current to the node pointer. So we will move current right over here. And in the next iteration we are out of string boundary. So we are done. We saw that the string av, that means the prefix av is exist in our try data structure. So we will just return it true. So if we call this function prefixers, it will simply return true. If we call this method with a limb, let's see how it works. Initially current pointer will point to this node and our current character is l. And here this node pointer will point to this node since the current character exists in this node. Then we will move current pointer to this node where node pointer is points to. So let's move here and here we are going to check if the current character m is exist. We see m is exist. So node will point right over here and in the next iteration we will move current to this node. In the next iteration we are out of the string boundary. So we are done. This if condition is never evaluated false for this string. So we will just return true for this string and we clearly see that lm prefix exists in this try data structure. Hope you have understood how this method actually works. This method will take big of in time complexity and constant space complexity. Hope you have understood this video explanation. If you are not understanding, I will highly encourage you to try to write out everything on a piece of paper and try with different examples. Then you will see how it works. Hope you guys understood this video explanation. If you have any question, if you have any suggestion, let us know. Thanks for watching. I will see you in another video. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we are going to implement this method search. This method takes a word as input. This method will return true if the word exists in the try data structure. Otherwise, it will return false. Let's see how we can implement this method search. For sake of understanding, let's assume we are given this try data structure where we have these three words avc, avz, lmn. The method search will check for a complete word it will not check for the prefix, it will check the complete word. If the complete word is exist in the try data structure, only then it will return true. Otherwise, it will return false. Now let's see the algorithm in pseudo code. This is our algorithm for search method. This method takes one parameter word. Inside here, we are declaring a pointer current that will point to the root node. And then we are running a loop for i from 0 to the length of the given word. Then we are checking if the current word is exist in our current node, then this node pointer will point to the associated try node for our current character. If node is evaluated null, then we will return false. If not, then we will move current pointer to the pointer node. When we are done with this for loop, we will check if the value in our current node. When we are done with this for loop, we will check end up word of our current node. If we found end up word is true, then we will return true. If end up word is false, then we will return false. Let's see how this method works. Let's say we call this function source with a v. First our character is a and current node is this root node. And we see here the character is exist. So node pointer will point to this node. Node pointer is not null. 
then we'll move current to this node where node pointer is points to then in the next iteration our character is b and we see b is exist in this node so node pointer will points to this node and we see node is not null so we'll move current to this node where where node pointer is points to and then in the next iteration we're done with this word then what we'll do we'll return the value end up word for our current node and we see that that is false so we will return false for this word so this word av is not exist in this try data structure because ab is the prefix of word abc search method will compare for complete word that's how it's written false now let's call this method with abc let's see how it works current character is a and current pointer will points to this node and we see this character a is exist in this node so we'll assign node pointer to this node because this node is the associated node for this character a we see that node is not null so we'll move current to this node in the next iteration we're going to move node pointer to this node and we see node is not null so we'll move current pointer to this node where node pointer is points to then in the next iteration we'll move our node pointer to this node we see node is not null so we'll move current to this node and we'll return the value true we see that this word is exist in this try data structure so for this word we'll return true hope you've understood how this method actually works now let's see one more function call if we call with lmn let's see how it works and what it will return our current character is l current pointer is pointing to this node and we see l is exist so node pointer will points to this node this node is not null so we'll move current to this node and we see the next character m is exist in this node so node will point to this node node is not null so we'll move current to this node in the next iteration our character is n n is exist in this node so node will move the node pointer will move to this node and node is not null so we'll move current to this node and we'll return whatever value we have for end of word that is true so for this function call we'll return true this is how this method works hope you've understood how this method actually works this method takes big of in time complexity and big of one space complexity hope you have understood this video explanation if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching i'll see you in another video hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to implement this method delete this method takes a word as input if the word is exist in the try data structure then this method will remove the word from the try data structure if the word is a prefix of another word then we'll just change the end up word for last character from true to false let's see how we can do that now let's see how we can implement this method for sake of understanding let's assume we're given this try data structure where we have three words abc abz and lmn this is the representation of try data structure where we have these three words this is our algorithm this delete method takes one parameter word inside here we're checking if the word is exist in our try data structure by calling this search method if the search method return true that means the word is exist in our try data structure then we'll call this method delete with root word and the index of the first character this is your delete method this method takes three parameter current this is your current node then word then the index of our current character inside here we're checking if the end of word of our current node is false then we'll return false if not we're going to set the end of word to false and we're going to return true if the size of our current node is zero that means if we have no elements in our current node we're setting this end of word to false because the words given may be the prefix of another word that's why we're setting the value of end of word of our current node to false this is our base case okay 
this is your current word and here we're checking if the current word is exist in our current node then this node will return a try node if the node return null then we'll just return false here we're calling this function delete recursively with the current node with the word and with our next character and here if we find out should delete current node equals to 2 then we will remove the character from our current node and we will return true if the size of our current node is 0 and at the end here we will return false and this will be done recursively this is going to be a little bit critical now let's see how this actually works if we call this method delete with l m and n if we call this method with lmn first we'll check if lmn is exist in our try data structure as a complete word we'll check that using this search method and we see that this word is exist in our try data structure so it will return true then we'll call this delete method with the first character the first character is l this is your base sketch index is not equals to word dot length initially and our current character is l and we see l is exist in our root node this is your current node and we see that the current character l is exist in our current node so this node will not return null then we're calling this function recursively again with node and the node pointer will points to this node by this statement and then we'll call with this node with the index of next character that means with the character m in the next recursive function call this is our current node so this is our current node for the next recursive function call and this is our current character now m is our current character and you see m is exist in this node so node pointer will points to this node and will call recursively with this node so current pointer will point to this node and our current character is n and we see n is exist in this node so node pointer will move to this node so node pointer will move to we see the current character n is exist in this node so we'll assign node pointer to this node we see node is not null so we'll call recursively again so current and node pointer will point to this same node now if we call for this recursive call the index is 3 and the length of this word is 3 as well now what are we going to do we're going to check the end of word of this node that is true so it will be evaluated false then what are we going to do we're going to set this true to false so we're going to set this true to false and we're going to return true if the size of this node is 0 and that is 0 so we'll return true so current pointer will point to this node and node will point to this node for the previous recursive function call this recursive function call for this node will return true since it's written true by this written statement we will remove the current character that is n we're going to remove this current character from this node so we'll remove n from this node and this node will be removed as well since there is no reference so we have removed the key we have removed the key so the value will be removed as well then our current pointer will point to this node and node pointer will point to this node then current pointer will point to this node and node pointer will point to this node will return true to the previous recursive call if the size of our current node is zero that is zero so we'll return true to the previous function call this value again evaluated true for the previous recursive function call in this case what we're going to do we're going to remove our current character m so we'll remove this character m from this node so this node will be removed as well since you have removed the key and we'll return true to the previous recursive function call if the value of our current node if the size of our current node is zero we see the size of our current node is zero so current pointer will point to this node and node will point to this node in the previous recursive function call we returned to using this statement so this statement is still true so what i'll do we'll remove l from this node and we'll move node to this node okay from here we're going to remove our current character l from this node 
so this node will be removed as well since we are going to remove the key and then we're going to return false because the size of our current node is not zero now we're done so we have deleted lmn word from our try data structure this is how we can delete a word now if we call this delete method with abc and we see that the abc word is exists in this try data structure and abc is a complete word so we'll call with the root node and with the word and with the index zero with the current character a this is our base case and we see our current character is exist so we'll move node to this node and here we see node is not pointing to a null node so we'll call with this node recursively so current pointer will point to this node and node will point to this node since node is not pointing to a null node we'll call recursively with current character now here b is our current character now in the next recursive function called c is your current character so current will move to this node and node will move to this node then we're going to call with this node recursively if we call it current pointer will point to this node in this time we're out of string boundary so the size of the string is 3 and the index is 3 as well so it's mass this base case here we see index equals to word dot length and we see here we have true so we will not return false and we're going to set this true to false and we see the size of this node is 0 so we'll return true to this recursive function call so current will point to the previous node and we see that this statement is evaluated true so what we will do we'll remove our current character c is our current character we're going to remove c from this try data structure so let's remove c since you have removed the key so the value will be removed value is this node and current will move to this node for the previous recursive call and the size is not zero of this current node so it will return false this statement will be evaluated false so it will just return true by this statement so current is pointing to this node and node is pointing to this node and we see that our current character is b for the previous recursive call we have a state for each recursive function call with the state we can access our current character since it's returned false by this function call again we're going to return false so current will point to this node node will point to this node there is nothing need to be done here because here we see a b is the prefix of this word a b z so we can't remove the current character and here we see the size of this node is not zero so we'll return false this is again evaluated false for the previous recursive function call it written false and we see that our current pointer is pointing to the root node and we're done we have deleted the word abc this is how we can delete a word from try data structure delete method will take big of in time complexity and big of in space complexity for the recursion call stack hope you've understood this video explanation if you have an issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about linear search algorithm linear search algorithm is used to find an element within a list it sequentially check each element of the list until a mass is found or the whole list has been searched for example if you are given this list of integer this is an array and we have to search an element in this array let's say we want to search the element 4 if we if we use linear search algorithm to search this element 4 in this array then we have to check the array element from left to right sequentially one by one first two then one then three then eight then seven then nine then we'll have our desired element time complexity for linear search algorithm is big of n and space complexity is big of one so linear search algorithm works in linear time complexity and in constant space complexity now let's say we're given this array and we have a target equals to 4 we have to find out the element 4 in this array using linear search algorithm if we apply here linear search algorithm first we'll check the target value 4 with the first element we see 4 is not equals to 2 so let's go to the next element we see 1 is not equals to 4 
Now let's go to the next element. Three is not equals to four. Let's go to the next element. Four is not equals to eight. Now let's go to the next element. Seven is not equals to four. Now let's go to the next element. Four is not equals to nine. Then let's go to the next element. Four is equals to four. So we find out our desired element at index six. And this is how linear search algorithm works. It check sequentially from left to right, one by one. First two, then one, then three, then eight, then seven, then nine, then four. And linear search algorithm works for sorted and unsorted array. Now let's see the pseudocode for linear search algorithm. This is our pseudocode for linear search algorithm. This method takes two parameter array and the target element here we have a loop for i from 0 to the length of the array here we're iterating the array from left to right and here we're checking if the current element equals to target then we will return the index of current element if the target element do not exist in the array then we will return minus one if we're given this array and target equals to six then if we apply this algorithm first we'll check six with two two is not equals to six then six and one one is not equals to six then three and six three is not equals to six then eight eight is not equals to six seven is not equals to six nine is not equals to six four is not equals to six so finally we find out six equals to six at the index seven this is how this linear search algorithm works this algorithm takes linear time complexity and constant space complexity this is super simple algorithm in this algorithm we have to scan the given array from left to right hope you have understood this video explanation if you have any question or if you have any issue understanding this video explanation let us know thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about binary search algorithm binary search is an efficient algorithm for finding an element from a sorted list of items it works by repeatedly dividing in half the portion of the list that could contain the item until we have narrowed down the possible location this is the formal definition of binary search algorithm for example if you're given this array and you have to find out an element in this array using binary search algorithm the binary search algorithm works in logarithmic time complexity and in constant space complexity binary search algorithm works in logarithmic time complexity and in constant space complexity now let's see how binary search algorithm works let's say we're given this array and a target value target equals to 7 first what are we going to do we're going to declare two pointer left and right left pointer will point to the first element right pointer will point to the last element so left point to this element 1 and right is pointing to this element 8 now let's calculate middle we can calculate middle by adding the index of left and right pointer and then we'll divide the summation of left and right pointer by 2 so 0 plus 7 divided 2 equals to a 3 so 4 is our middle now what are we going to do we're going to check the value 7 with this value if we see target is greater than 4 then we'll move left to the next element if we see target is less than middle then we'll move right to the left of middle here we see that 7 is greater than 4 so we'll move left to the next of middle so left will point to this element 5 now let's calculate the middle 4 plus 7 divided 2 so 4 plus 7 equals to 11 11 divided 2 5 so 6 is our middle we see 7 is not equal to 6 and we see 7 is greater than 6 so let's move left to the next of middle so let's move left to the next of middle so left will point to this element 7 now let's calculate middle 7 plus 6 divided 2 equals to 6 
so middle is this element 7 now we see that middle equals to target so we find out the desired element in this array so we'll return the index of this element 7 that is 6 and this is how binary search algorithm works binary search algorithm works only for sorted array it will not work for unsorted array in this algorithm we will divide our given array into two half in each step and we'll see how it works when we go through pseudocode binary search algorithm is similar to searching a value in a binary search tree let's see how first we're going to construct binary search tree data structure from this sorted array first four four is our root node on the left we have two on the left of two we have one then on the right of two we have three then here the right of four is six the left of six is five and the right of six is seven and the right of seven is eight now let's say we want to search the target seven then what you can do first we'll compare the value with this root we see that target is greater than so we'll go to the right subtree so we'll move to the right subtree here we see six is not equals to seven and six is less than seven so let's go to the right subtree here we see seven equals to seven so we'll return the index of this element or we'll return true for binary search tree okay we can return the index for array for binary search tree, we can return true and this is how it works and this is exactly similar to binary search tree and this is exactly the binary search algorithm exactly similar to searching a value in a binary search tree and this is how it works let's say we want to search a value 3 in this array now let's see how it works here we have constructed binary search tree from this array first we're going to compare this value with the root 3 is not equals to 4 so let's go to the left here we see that 2 is not equals to 3 and 2 is less than 3 so let's go to the right and here we see 3 equals to 3 so we'll return true for this array we'll return the index this is how binary search algorithm works hope you have understood how binary search algorithm relates to binary search tree data structure when it search a value in a binary search tree now let's see the pseudocode this is the pseudocode for binary search tree this method takes two parameter array and target here we're declaring two pointer left and right left will point to the first element right will point to the last element then we have here while loop while left is less than equals to right we are calculating here middle and here we can use here we can use different formula to avoid overflow then here we have if air mid equals to target if we find out the middle element equals to target then we will return the index of middle element else if we'll compare if target is greater than the middle element then we'll move left pointer to the next of middle element if not we'll move right pointer to the left of middle element if the target value do not exist in the array then we'll return minus one for example let's say we're given this array and target equals to six here we have two pointer left and right left will point to this element and right will point to this element now let's find out middle this is our middle we see 6 is not equals to 4 and 6 is greater than 4 so we'll move left to this so we'll move left to this element and the middle is this element here you see the middle element equals to the target element so we find out our desired element in this array and this is how this binary search algorithm works this algorithm takes logarithmic time complexity now let's find out the time complexity of this algorithm initially the length of our array is n divided to the power zero and that's equals to n after first iteration length equals to n divided to for second iteration length equals to n divided to the power two after third iteration length equals to n divided to the power three after kth iteration length equals to n divided to the power k so here we find out a pattern here for kth iteration 
length equals to n divided to the power k. We're dividing the array into two halves in each step. So after k division, length of the array will be 1. So we can say n divided to the power k equals to 1. So n equals to 2 to the power k. Then if we take log here, this log is 2 base log. Then we get log n equals to log 2 to the power k. And here we get log n equals to k. And then k equals to log n. This is 2 base log. So the time complexity is big of log n. And the space complexity is big of 1. Since we're using three variables left, right, and middle. Hope you've understood binary source algorithm and the time complexity of binary source algorithm. If you have any issue understanding this video explanation or if you have any suggestion, let us know. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video. In this video, we're going to talk about a Babel sort algorithm. Babel sort is the simplest sorting algorithm that works by repeatedly swapping the adjacent elements if they are in wrong order. Uh, let's take an example to understand Babel sort. For example, let's suppose that you are given this integers array. You have to sort this array. First, what are we going to do? We are going to check first two adjacent and these are the adjacent and here we see 8 is greater than 2. If the if the left element is greater than the right, we're going to swap them. We see left element is less than 8. So we'll not swap. Now let's check the next pair. And this is the next pair. And here we see 8 is greater than 5. So we're going to swap this two element. 8 will move to this index and 5 will move to this index. Now let's compare these two pairs. In these two pairs, we see that the left element is greater than the right. So we're going to swap them. So if we swap, 8 will move here and 1 will move here. Now let's compare this pair. In this pair, we see that the left is greater than the right. So we're going to swap them. If we swap, 8 will move to this index 4 and 6 will move to this index 3. Now we're going to compare the next pair and this is the next pair and in this pair we see that left element is greater than the right so we're going to move 8 to this index 5 and 3 to the index 4. So let's move 3 to this index 4 right here. Here we should have 8. We get this array after the first iteration. We bubbled off the largest element to the right. So our right part is now sorted. Now we're going to bubble off the largest element in this unsorted part. In the unsorted subarray, we're going to bubble off the largest element to the right. So now let's compare this two pair. We see two is less than five. So so nothing need to be done here. In the next pair is this. We see that 5 is greater than 1, so let's swap them. 1 will move here, and 5 will move here. Now let's compare these two pair, and here we see that 5 is less than 6, so we nothing need to be done here. Then the next pair is 6 and 4, and we see that 6 is greater than 4, so we're going to swap them. So if we swap 4, will move to this index 3 and and 6 will move to this index 4. After the second part, we get this array and the right part is sorted and the left part is unsorted. In the unsorted part, we're going to bubble up the largest element to the right. So let's bubble up the largest element in the unsorted part to the right. So first we'll compare these two pair. We see 2 is greater than 1, so 1 will move here and 2 will move here. Now let's compare this pair and in this pair we see that 2 is less than 5. Nothing need to be done here. Then this 2 pair we see that 5 is greater than 4 so we have to swap them. If we swap 4 will move here and 5 will move to this index 3. After the third part we see that 
the right part is a sorted array and the left part is unsorted array. Now we're going to bubble off the largest element in the unsorted part to the end of this unsorted list. We'll compare these two and we see that they're in correct order. In these two, we see that they're in correct order. So nothing need to be done here. So after this path, we see the left part is unsorted and in the unsorted part let's bubble off the largest element to the right let's compare these two and we see that two is already bubbled up this right part is sorted left part is unsorted we see that on the left we have only one element so nothing need to be done here and this is the sorted array okay and this is how bubble sort works the concept is that we will bubble off the largest element to the end for our unsorted list and this is how bevel sort works. Now let's see how we can implement this concept using Zing sudo code. This is the sudo code. First we have this function bevel sort that takes the nums array then n equals to length of this array. This is the length and then we're running a loop from i to n minus 2. So this loop will run from the index 0 to the index 4. Okay. We don't need to compare for this element on the right of this element we have no element and then we have this flag to optimize this algorithm if the given array is already sorted then this loop will not run okay and then we have here this for loop from for j from 0 to n minus i minus 2 and then we're going to compare if the first element that means in the left element if the left element is greater than the right we'll swap them using this formula if the array is already sorted then this value will never be changed after doing this for loop you will find flag equals to false that means the array is already sorted we don't have to compare anymore so we can just stop we have here break now let me show you how it works one more time so this times we're going to here we have 2 and 8 let's compare them and 8 is greater than 2 that's okay then for this pairs 8 will move here 5 will move here then for next pair we see 8 will move here and 1 will move here then for next comparison for this two element 8 will move here and 6 will move here and for next comparison we see that 8 will move here and 3 will move here by this algorithm you can go through this algorithm to see how it works now after the first part we see that the right part is sorted the left part is unsorted now let's bubble off the largest element on the unsorted part to the to this unsorted part so here we're going to check this two they're in correct order then this one five will move here and one will move here and then for this check we see that they're in correct order for this pair we see six will move here and three will move here so now we see that this part is now sorted the right part is sorted the left part is unsorted now let's bubble up the largest to the end of this unsorted part so 2 is greater than 1 so let's swap them 2 will move here and 1 will move here then for this 2 we see they are in correct order then this 2 3 will move here and 5 will move to this index 3 at this point we see that the right part is sorted and the left part is already sorted if we do all the comparisons then we see the array will be sorted something like this and this is how bubble sort works and the time complexity of bubble sort algorithm is bigger of n square and the space complexity is bigger of one that means it works in constant space complexity when you consider space complexity then we can use bubble sort algorithm and for the best case, it will take bigger of n space complexity if the array is already sorted. Now, let me show you the time complexity analysis in details. Alright, we have to calculate the time complexity, time complexity uh, for this function, okay? Here, the length, it will be calculated in constant time complexity, then this loop will take bigger of n time complexity. Actually, it will take bigger of n minus 1 time complexity since n is the length of the array it will start from 0 to n so it will take big of n minus 1 time complexity and that's equivalent to big of n and here this will take constant time complexity and this will take for the worst case big of n minus 1 
time complexity that's equivalent to big of n and this all will take constant space complexity to analyze this time complexity we're going to take this array as an example the length of this array is 6 for the first iteration of this outer loop we have here the value i equals to 0 this loop will execute 5 times so the execution is 5 for i equals to 1 this loop will execute 4 times here we have the execution for i equals to 2 this loop the inner loop will execute 3 times for i equals to 3 inner loop will execute 2 times for i equals to 4 the inner loop will execute will execute 1 times and here we have the execution here we see a pattern and the length of this array is 6 so we see a pattern is that n minus 1 so n minus 1 for this array is 6 minus 1 that is 5 n minus 2 4 n minus 3 n minus 3 3 and so on and so forth and at the some point we will have 1 okay something like this at the end the last execution will be evaluated 1 so we can write it this execution as equation something like this and if we solve this equation then we get then we get this equation n times n minus 1 divided 2 and if we do this equation then we get n square minus n divided 2 and the degree of this equation is n square so the time complexity is big of n square and the space complexity for this solution is big of 1 that means it works in constant space complexity since you are not using an additional space this is how we can analyze it time complexity of an algorithm this is a babel sort algorithm this is pretty easy algorithm to implement and this is the way to find out the time complexity of a algorithm hope you have understood the babel sort algorithm and the runtime analysis and here we break it down this constant time and linear time complexity here for each line to make you understand every single details i think you have a clear understanding of time complexity analysis thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video till then take care hey what's up guys in this video we're going to talk about selection sort algorithm selection sort algorithm is an in place comparison based algorithm in which the list is divided into two parts the sorted part at the left end and the unsorted part at the right end initially the sorted part is empty and the unsorted part is the entire list this is selection sort algorithm now let's see how selection sort algorithm works for that let's take an example let's suppose that we're given this array we have to sort this array using selection sort for selection sort algorithm we have two parts left part and right part the left part is sorted and the right part is unsorted first our sorted part is empty that means our left part is empty and the right part is your entire list on the unsorted parts that means on the right part we're going to find out the minimum element and in this so on the right part the minimum element is 2 now what are we going to do we're going to swap this value 2 with 9 with the first index okay this is the first index and here if we swap then 9 will move to this index 4 and 2 will move to this index 0 now our sorted part is this part now our left part is sorted right part is unsorted okay in the unsorted part let's find out the minimum element and the minimum element on the right part is 5 now what are we going to do we're going to swap this 5 with the first value in the unsorted part or with the first element in the unsorted part so 5 will move to this index 1 and 6 will move to this index 3 now our sorted part is this part so this left part is now sorted now let's find out the minimum in the unsorted part the minimum in the unsorted part is 6 so we're going to swap this 6 with the 
first element in the unsorted part and that is seven so let's swap them six will move to this index two and seven will move to this index three so now our sorted part is the left part and here on the left part two five six is now sorted now on the right part let's find out the minimum element and that is seven and seven in its right position nothing to be done here so here now the left part is now sorted now we're going to find out the minimum in the unsorted part and the minimum in the unsorted part is eight so we're going to move eight to this index four and we're going to move nine to this index five now this left part is now sorted and the right part is unsorted since we have on the right only one element so it's already sorted now we see that inter array is now sorted two five six seven eight nine and this is how selection sort works now let's see how we can implement selection sort using pseudo code this is the algorithm for selection sort first we have function selection sort that takes an array as input then we're calculating the length and then we're running a for loop for i from 0 to n minus 2 then we have this mean index equals to i okay initially the first index is the minimum index and then we're running this loop for j from i plus 1 to n minus 1 then we're gonna check if nums j is less than nums minimum index then we're going to change the minimum index to the to the current index for this for loop and then we're just swapping the minimum element with the first element in the unsorted list now let me show you how it works once more time so initially we have here nine okay and initially we have the sorted list is empty and the minimum element in this unsorted list is two and we can find the minimum element using this array okay something like this we are finding the minimum element using this for loop and we found this minimum element here that is two and we're gonna swap this element to the first element in the unsorted list so two will move to this index zero and nine will move to this index four so we swapped using this formula now our sorted list is this so on the left we have sorted list and on the right we have unsorted list now the minimum element in the unsorted list is five so the minimum index for the second iteration of this for loop is the index here three now we're going to swap this element to the first element in this unsorted list and there is six so five will move here and six will move here now the sorted part is this two and five and the unsorted part is seven six nine eight now the minimum element in this unsorted part is six okay so we're gonna swap six and seven six will move here and seven will move here now the left subarray is now sorted on the right let's find out the minimum the minimum is seven it's already in the correct position so we have to do nothing here and then here we have 9 and 8 the minimum is 8 so let's swap them we swap 8 will move to this index 4 and 9 will move to this index 8 and 9 will move to this index 5 okay and we see that they are in already sorted order and if we split it right here and we see the left part is sorted the right part on the right part we have only one element so the element in its correct position since we have only one element on the right and this is how we can solve this problem and this is the selection sort algorithm and this is how it works hope you have understood selection sort algorithms now let's see the time and space complexity the time complexity for this algorithm is big of n square and the space complexity for this algorithm is big of one that means constant space complexity since we're not using any additional space now let's see how we can find out the time complexity big of n square here we break it down each iterations and here you have to calculate the time complexity when you have the length of the given array is n and here we have constant operations and here we have some linear operation and this operation will take big of n minus 1 and that's equivalent to big of n since you are iterating from 0 to n minus 2 
and uh, same thing uh, here for our sketch and this is linear time okay and all other operation takes constant time now how this works and for the the inner loop iterates five times so execution is five for i equals to one the inner loop executes four times and so on and so forth and for i equals to four we get one here you see that five four three two one so you have something like this in minus one in minus two in minus three in minus four in minus five so we can write the equation something like this n minus one plus n minus two plus n minus three when n is unknown or whatever okay and at some point we'll find out the execution one and if we do this formula from this formula we get n times n minus one divided to two and that's equivalent to n square minus n divided to two and here the degree of this equation is n square so the time complexity is bigger of n square the space complexity for this solution is bigger of one the solution works in constant space complexity uh, so when we need to save a space then we can consider using selection sort algorithm and this is all about this video hope you have understood the time complexity and the selection sort algorithm thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about insertion sort algorithm insertion sort algorithm is an in place comparison based algorithm in which the list is divided into two parts the sorted part at the left end and the unsorted part at the right end initially the sorted part is empty and the unsorted part is the entire list for example, if you are given this unsorted array, we have to sort this array using insertion sort. Initially, the sorted part is empty and the unsorted part is the entire list. So the left part is empty and the right part is the entire list. We will pick the first element from the unsorted part, in this case 4, and we will move this to this position now the left part is sorted and the right part is unsorted since the insertion sort algorithm is an in place algorithm so we will modify the given array now what we're going to do we're going to get this element 2 right the first element from the unsorted part and we will insert it to the right position now we're going to compare 2 and 4 here we see that 4 is greater than 2 so we will swap them if we swap them two will move here and four will move here now we see that on the left of two we have no element now we see that this left part is now sorted and the right part is unsorted so let's pick this element five and let's insert it to the right position in the sorted part we see that five is greater than four so nothing need to be done here now the left part is sorted the right part is unsorted and let's pick this element 8 and let's put it in the right position to the sorted part and we see that 8 is greater than 5 so nothing need to be done here now we see that the left part is now sorted and the right part is unsorted from this right part we're going to pick this element 6 and we're going to insert it to the right position in the sorted part we see 6 is less than 8 so we will swap them if we swap here we get 6 and here we get 8 and let's compare this 6 and 5 we see 6 is greater than 5 so nothing need to be done here so the left part is now sorted right part is unsorted let's pick this element 9 we see 9 already in its correct position yeah so now we see that the left part is sorted the right part is unsorted now what are we going to do we're going to compare this 1 and 9 we see that 1 is less than 9 so we'll swap them if we swap them 9 will move here and 1 will move here now let's compare this to 1 and 8 we see 1 is less than 8 so let's swap them if we swap them 8 will move to this index 5 8 will move here and 1 will move here now we're going to compare this two element 1 and 6 and we see that 1 is less than 6 so let's swap them if we swap them one will move here and six will move here 
Now let's compare these two elements, one and five. One is less than five. So let's swap them. So one will move to this index two and five will move to this index three. And again, we see that four is greater than one. So let's swap them. If we swap, one will move to this index one, four will move to this index two. Again, we see that one is less than two. So let's swap them. If we swap them, we get here two and here one. And on the left, we have no element. So nothing need to be done here. Now we're done. And now we see that this array is now sorted. Now the entire array is sorted. And this is how insertion sort works. It will pick the first element from the unsorted part and it will insert to the right position in the sorted part. And this is how insertion sort works. So we have to return this array. Now let's see the algorithm. All right, this is the algorithm for insertion sort. First, we have this function insertion sort that takes the given nums array. Then we're gonna find out the length and then we're running a loop from zero to n minus one. Then we have temp variable. Temp will store the current element and j equals to i. Then we're gonna check if j is greater than zero and the left element is greater than the temp element. Then we will change the current element with the left element. When we're done with the loop, we'll do this formula nums j equals to temp and then at the end we're going to return the nums array. Now let's see how this actually works. For sake of understanding, let's assume we're given this array. For the first iteration of this for loop, I will point to this element 8, z will point to this element 8 and temp will point to this element 8. This condition inside this while loop is false because z is not a greater than zero. z is the index of our current element. So this while loop will not run. Then we're gonna swap this element eight with this element eight. So we're done with the first iteration. After the first iterations, the left part is sorted, the right part is unsorted. Now temp is pointing to this element six and z is pointing to this element six as well. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to check if z is greater than zero. Yes, z is greater than zero and the left element is greater than the temp. So what are we going to do? We're going to replace this six with the left element and that is eight. The left element is eight. Now j is pointing to this element eight and now the whole loop will stop here since z is now pointing to zero. So we're going to swap j with the value of temp. At temp variable, we have the value six. So we will replace this eight with six. Now, what are we going to do? Now we see that the left part is sorted and the right part is unsorted. Now our temp is pointing to this element five, temp equals to five, and j will point to this element five. Now we're gonna check if z minus one, and that means this element 8 is greater than 5. Yes, 8 is greater than 5. So what are we going to do? We're going to replace 5 with 8. Then z is pointing to this index 1. Now we're going to check z minus 1. That means this element 6. Does 6 greater than the temp? Temp equals to 5. Yes, it is. So we're going to replace this element 8 with 6. So we're going to replace this element six with, so we're going to replace this element eight with six. Then z is pointing to this element at index zero. And here this while loop stuff and we're going to replace six with the value of temp variable, temp equals to five. So let's replace six with five. Now the left part is sorted and the right part is unsorted. Now temp will point to this element four. So temp equals to four and j will point to this element four as well. Now we're gonna check z minus one, that is eight. Does eight is greater than the temp? We see that eight is greater than four, so we're going to replace four with eight. Remember it, temp is storing the value of this element four, okay? Now j is pointing to this index two, and here we see z minus one is greater than 5 so we're going to replace 8 with 6 then z will point to this element 
Now we're going to check z minus 1. If z minus 1 is greater than 5, we see that z minus 1 is 5, 5 is greater than 4. At the same variable, we have 4. So what we're going to do, we're going to replace 6 with 5. So let's replace 6 with 5 here. Now let's move z to the left. And here, z is now pointing to this element 5. And while loop will stop here. So we're going to replace this 5 with the value of 10 variable and that is 4. So let's replace this value 5 with 4. Now we're done with the iterations. Now we have this left array and the right array. Now we have this left part is sorted, right part is unsorted. Now this is our temp. And z is pointing to this element 2 and temp equals to 2. Now we're going to check z minus 1 and temp. So z minus 1 is this element 8 and temp is 2. We see that z minus 1 is a greater than temp. So we're going to so we're going to move 8 to this index 8. Let's move it here. And now j is pointing to this element 8. And here j minus 1 is 6. 6 is greater than 2. So let's replace 8 with 6 then z is pointing right here now z minus 1 is 5 5 is greater than 2 so let's replace 6 with 5 z will point to this element 5 and now we're going to compare z minus 1 that is 4 4 is greater than 2 so let's replace this 5 with 4 so we're going to replace 5 with 4 and on the left we have this element 4 and z is pointing to this element with this while loop stuff here and now what are we going to do we're going to replace this 4 with 2 so let's replace 4 with 2 now we're done so after this iteration we have this left part sorted and the right part is unsorted we have only one element now let's pick this element and let's put it to the right position so now temp equals to 1 and z is pointing to this element 1 initially we see 1 is we see z minus 1 8 8 is greater than temp so we're going to replace 1 with 8 then similarly z will point here and we're going to replace 8 with the value on the left and that is 6 so let's replace 8 with 6 now z will point here and we see z minus 1 is greater than temp so let's replace 6 with 5 now z will point to this element 5 and here we see 5 is greater than 1 so let's replace 5 with 4 then similarly z is pointing here and we're going to replace 4 with 2 and then z will point here now we're done with this while loop so we're going to replace this 2 with 1 so if we replace this 2 with 1 we get this array now our enter array is sorted and this is how insertion sort works and this is your algorithm to solve this problem hope you have understood the insertion sort now let me show you the time complexity and the space complexity the space complexity for this problem is big O of 1 that means it works in constant space complexity since we are modifying the given array we are not using any extra space now let's see the time complexity for this problem to analyze for sake of understanding we assume this is our given array for the worst sketch and this is our algorithm and here we have to calculate the time complexity time t of n and here we break it down every single line and this for loop will take big o of n this while loop will take big o of n for the worst sketch and all others will take a constant time complexity and here we have break it down the iterations for our loops and here we have the execution if we add all the execution then we get something like this 1 plus 2 plus dot dot dot, dot plus n equals to n times n plus 1 divided 2 and here we get this equation n square plus n divided 2 and the degree of this equation is n square that means the highest term of this equation is n square so the time complexity is big of n square and the space complexity is big of 1 because you're not using any additional space we're just modifying the given array all right guys this is all about this video thanks for watching this video i'll see you in the next video
hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about a bucket short algorithm bucket short is a sorting algorithm that works by distributing the elements of an array into a number of buckets each bucket is then sorted individually either using a different sorting algorithm or by recursively applying the bucket sorting algorithm this is the formal definition of a bucket sort algorithm so if we're given this array we have to return this array this is unsorted this is sorted and you have to sort this array using bucket sort and in this video we'll see the concept of bucket sort algorithm and we'll see how it works bucket sort algorithms is useful only for uniformly distributed data if the data is not uniformly distributed then the purpose of bucket sort is defeated now let's see how bucket sort algorithm works and how we can sort an array using bucket sort so first we're going to create a number of buckets that means uh, we're gonna find out the number of buckets first by using a simple formula by taking sale or floor of square root of the length of the array then we'll iterate through each element and place it in appropriate bucket appropriate bucket equals to sale and then value times number of buckets and we'll divide that by the max value in the array and this is how we can find out the appropriate bucket and then we will sort all the buckets and we'll merge all the buckets and then we'll get our array is sorted now let's see how it works uh, if you're given this array for example first we have to find out the number of buckets to find out number of buckets we'll use this formula and here we will take sale sale square root of length of this array so length of this array is 10 so square root of 10 is 3 point something and if we take sale of 3 point something that will be evaluated for so we're going to uh, construct four brackets we have number of buckets equals to four here we have four buckets then we're going to iterate through each element and we'll place it in its appropriate bucket first we have 40 so in which bucket we'll insert 40 so bucket equals to sale value times number of buckets we have four buckets so 40 times 4 equals to 160 and 160 divided the maximum value in this array is 100 so 1 point something that means uh, sale of 1 point something is 2 so 14 will goes to this bucket 2 then we can find out the appropriate bucket using this formula 10 will goes to this bucket 1 30 will goes to this bucket 2 similarly 90 will goes to this bucket 4 then 80 will goes to this bucket 4 then 70 will goes to this bucket 3 20 will goes to the bucket 1 60 will goes to the bucket 3 50 will goes to the bucket 2 and 100 will goes to the bucket 4 now this is our bucket we have inserted the right element in the appropriate bucket now we're going to sort the bucket if we sort the bucket our bracket will be represented something like this okay now our bucket is sorted now our goal is to merge all the buckets and return that merged array and if we merge the buckets then we get this array 10 20 then 30 40 50 then 60 70 80 90 100 and this is how bucket sort works now let me show you the algorithm and then also we'll see how it actually works line by line this is our algorithm for bucket sort we'll use this formula number of buckets equals to sale the square root of the length of the given array then maximum value and the minimum value okay using this follow we're going to find out the minimum value and the maximum value and then we're declaring a bucket with the size of the number of buckets we have calculated right over here then we are creating the number of buckets we need to insert in this list and then we are uh, inserting the right element to the appropriate bucket and then we are sorting each bucket and then we are merging the buckets using this for loop here you are using quick sort and you can use any other sort like merge sort no matter what now let's see how this actually works one more time for sake of understanding let's assume we're given this array and we have here four buckets by doing this formula so root over 10 will be evaluated 
3 point something and the sale of 3 point something is 4 so we have 4 buckets now 40 for 40 the appropriate bucket is 40 times 4 divided by 100 that is 1.6 uh, the sale of 1.6 is 2 so 40 will goes to this so 40 will goes to this bucket 2 then 10 4 times 10 40 40 divided 100 0 point something so 10 will goes to this bucket 1 then 30 30 times 4 is 120 and 120 divided 100 is 1.3 so the sale of 1.3 is 2 so so 30 will goes to this bucket 2 then 90 4 times 90 so 4 times 90 equals to uh, 360 so 360 divided 100 equals to 3.6 uh, that's evaluated the sale of 3.6 is 4 so so 90 will goes to this bucket 4 and we can find out the appropriate bucket using this formula pretty easily and this is the formula and 80 will move to this bucket 4 then 70 will move to this bucket 3 20 will goes to this bucket 1 60 will goes to this bucket 3 50 will goes to this bucket 2 and 100 will goes to this bucket 4 now our job is to sort the bucket if we sort the bucket is bucket if we sort the is bucket we get this bucket okay now our goal is to merge all the buckets if we merge first 10 then 20 then 30 40 50 60 70 80 90 100 so if we merge all the buckets we get this array and this is how bucket sort works hope you have understood the concept of bucket sort if the array is not uniformly distributed then the purpose of bucket sort is defeated for that case all the element will goes to only one bucket and that will sticks for the worst case because of n square time complexity and that's the worst thing and for the best case this will takes uh, if the data is uniformly distributed then the time complexity is bigger of n log n for the quick sort algorithm and if we add all the for loop uh, the time complexity then we get bigger of n plus bigger of n plus bigger of n plus bigger of n and uh, the overall time complexity is bigger of n log n for the quick sort or merge sort algorithm whatever algorithms you will use to sort the buckets and the space complexity is bigger of n if you use quick sort uh, then no extra space is required but you have to construct the bucket so that the space complexity should be bigger of n if the data is not uniformly distributed the time complexity would be bigger of n squared and that is not the purpose of bucket sort if the data is uniformly distributed only then we will consider using bucket sort all right guys hope you have understood the concept of bucket sort thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video bye hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about merge sort algorithm this is one of the efficient sorting algorithm now let's see how merge sort actually works in this video we're going to see how merge sort works then we'll see line by line explanation then we'll see the runtime analysis merge sort divides an input array into two halves keep breaking those two halves recursively until they become simple enough to be solved then each of the broken pieces are merged together we will see how this actually works this is the formal definition of merge sort algorithm uh, for example if you're given this array using this merge sort algorithm we have to sort this array in ascending order something like this so for this given array we have to return this array now let's see how merge sort actually works for sake of understanding let's assume we're given this array now we're going to break it down this array into two halves by doing a simple formula the index of the first element plus the index of the last element so 0 plus 6 divided 2 equals to 3 so on the first half we have the element from 0 to 3 and on the second half we have element from from 4 to the end and we'll break it down into two halves in dfs manner or in depth first manner so first we're going to break it down into this half so in this half we have this four element 
and again we're going to break it down this subarray into two halves then we get this subarray from this subarray and then again we're going to break it down this subarray and then we get this only one subarray and we can't break it down anymore then let's go to the right on the right of the subarray 2 and now we're going to sort and merge this two subarray uh, here we'll use a techniques called merge to sorted array and that's super simple if we merge and sort this two array two will move here and four will move here okay so we have solved this subarray and this subarray we get two and four now let's break it down uh, to the second half of this subarray so we get five and eight and let's break it down further we get five and eight now what are we going to do we're going to merge and sort this two single speech if we merge and sort this two single pitch we get five and eight now what are we going to do we're going to merge this two sorted array this is subarray and these two array are sorted so if we merge this two sorted array then we get two then four then five eight so if we merge this two sorted subarray we get this subarray two four five eight so now we're done with the left part now let's go to the right part and this is your right part and let's break it down into two halves so on the left we have two element and then again let's break it down we have six and then we have here nine we can't break it down six and we can't break it down nine any further so now let's sort them and merge them so if we merge and sort this two subarray we get a six and nine now let's go to the right on the right you have only one and now let's merge and sort these two sorted array and if we merge and sort these two subarray we get one six nine one six and nine now we have solved this two subarray left and right and here we see that this two subarray are in sorted order they're sorted so if we merge these two sorted array then we will get the sorted array something like this one then two then here four one two four then here we should have five then six then eight and then nine all right so if we merge and sort these two subarray then we get this array and this is how merge sort works we're going to break it down the given array into two halves using recursion and we'll break it down using depth first search or that's called depth first traversal something like that and this is how it works now let's see the algorithm and then we'll see how it actually works again this is the merge sort algorithm first you have this function merge sort it takes nums array left and right if right is greater than left then we're gonna calculate middle by this formula left plus right minus left divided to we can do here simply left plus right divided to and that might cause uh, overflow uh, that's why we're using this formula then we're calling this function merge sort with nums left mid and merge sort nums mid plus one right recursively and then we're merging and sorting the the two subarray okay and this is the function to merge and sort the two subarray we have a left temporary right temporary then we're copying the element from our array to left temporary and to the right temporary and then at the end of left temporary we're uh, inserting a maximum integer just for a merging purposes and that's super interesting and then you have here two pointer p1 and p2 to merge to sorted array and this is super interesting and super simple now let's see how this works uh, now we're gonna we're gonna call this function merge sort recursively something like this and we can't call this function anymore we reached to this uh, subarray now let's call this merge sort nums mid plus one and right and then we get four and two now let's sort it using this merge function this function will merge and sort the two subarray so two will move here and four will move here now let's call it with the right part the right part is five and eight then left part left part is five then right part right part is eight now we're going to merge these two part here we already processed these two summary here and then let's process these two if we merge these two separate the left equals to this 
summary and write equals to this temporary summary and then we're adding this maximum integer just for sorting purposes uh, just for sorting and merging purposes then we're gonna merge this to and sort uh, if we sort and merge this to summary then we get this now we're gonna merge and sort this summary then we get two four five eight so here two then four so here we see this left summary is now sorted two four five eight now let's call it with the right part the right part is six nine one and let's call it the left left is six nine and the right is one and then the left of six nine is six and the right is nine now let's let's sort and merge this to summary and if we do that then we get this summary okay this is already sorted now let's call with this one and only we have one now let's merge this to sorted array then we'll have one six then nine so now the left and the right array we get this left array is sorted and the right array is sorted and this is subarray now if we merge this to sorted array then we get something like this now we see that if we merge this to sorted array then we get this array and we can merge this to sorted array using this function merge and this is how merge sort works hope you have understood the concept when you're merging this two left subarray we're modifying the element in our given array to the main array okay and here just sake of understanding we are we're just modifying that right here but actually we're adding that value to our main array because we're using a reference here we're just sending the given array and here we're just directly adding to that array uh, we're not merging that to a uh, temporary array and that element we're going to insert uh, to the right position to our uh, main array don't be confused about that just for sake of understanding we're just merging this two and we're just showing it right here we're actually adding this value to our uh, main array okay hope you've understood the merge sort algorithms and this is how merge sort algorithm works now let me uh, analyze the time complexity and the space complexity the space complexity for this solution is bigger of n because we're uh, creating a temporary array for our sketch we're going to create a uh, two temporary array n divided two and n divided two so the overall space complexity is bigger of n now let me analyze the time complexity all right here we break it down every single line and we have to calculate this t of n the time complexity for this n when the length of the given array is n and this takes big of one then this operation takes big of one and we're just uh, dividing this array by two halves each time for each recursive call stack and then we're merging the two subarray and this function takes big of end and here we can see uh, how we can calculate the big of end here we have just some loop it's super simple so this function uh, takes big of n so if we add all the time complexity here t of n equals to big of one big of one then t of n divided 2 t of n divided 2 plus n here we're doing n executions so here it will take n steps that's why we have here n it's t of n equals to t of n divided 2 t of plus t of n divided 2 plus n and we can just skip big of 1 because they're constant now let me show you how we can find out the time complexity uh, to find out time complexity you have to do your back substituting now let's see how we can do that okay we are given this so we find out this equation t of n equals to t of n divided 2 plus t of n divided 2 plus n and if we add this to t of n divided 2 then we get 2 t n divided 2 plus n and this is our equation 1 and if we substitute n by n divided 2 in equation 1 then we get this equation and you can calculate this by putting n equals to n divided 2 to this equation 1 now if we substitute this equation 2 into equation 1 then we get this equation t of n equals to 2 to the power 2 times t of n divided 2 to the power 2 plus 2 times n again if we insert n divided 4 at the pledge n to the equation 1 then we get this equation if we substitute this equation 3 to the equation 1 then we get this equation so here we find out a pattern the pattern identified is something like this t of n equals to 2 to the power i times t of n divided 2 to the power i 
plus i times n this is the pattern we have identified each time when we are calling the merge sort function we are calling with the n divided 2 when we are calling the merge sort functions we are dividing that array into two halves each time at the some point we will find out n divided 2 to the power i equals to 1 so we can assume that n divided 2 to the power i equals to 1 and here if we solve this problem we get log 2 n equals to i now if we substitute i to this equation with log 2n then we get this equation here 2 to the power log 2n it will be evaluated n and here t n divided n because this will be evaluated n and then we have a log 2n times n here we find out n times t of 1 plus log 2n times n t of 1 so it will take constant time complexity this is a base sketch so when you have the size of the array uh, when you're calling recursively uh, then it will takes only one execution so we can assume t of 1 equals to 1 so n times 1 plus log 2n times n and finally we get n plus log 2n times n and this is the highest term in this equation so the time complexity is bigger of n times log 2n so we find out that the time complexity is bigger of n times log 2n and the space complexity is bigger of n and this is the merge sort algorithm hope you have understood merge sort algorithm in details and also you have understood the runtime analysis if you have any problem if you have any suggestion let us know thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video bye hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about a quick short algorithm this is one of the efficient sorting algorithm in this video we'll see how quick short works and all the informations you need to understand quick short algorithms then we'll I talk about the random analysis of this algorithm quick short works by selecting a pivot element from the array and it will partition at the pivot point into two hubs where the smaller element on the left and the greater element on the right it will keep doing this process recursively until the entire array is sorted for example if you're given this array you have to return this sorted array in ascending order using the concept of quick short algorithm the concept is that first we have to pick a pivot and we have to partition that array based on pivot all the elements on the left of pivot are less than and all the elements on the right of pivot are greater than now let me show you how quickshot algorithm actually works we will consider the rightmost element the pivot element okay now let's see how it works for second point understanding let's assume that we're given this array here we have the index number from 0 to 8 and first we'll pick this 5 as pivot and this is your recursion call tree and uh, this is how we will solve this problem don't worry uh, first let's see how we can solve this problem and we will solve this problem in a depth first manner or in dfs manner let's see how so this is our pivot element initially and we have to insert this pivot element in the right position where we have the left element are less than and the right element are greater than so if we partitions this array by uh, considering 5 is the pivot then we get this array okay this is 5 this is pivot and on the left we have all the elements are less than pivot on the right all the elements are greater than pivot and here we see we have the pivot index is 4 we'll see how we can partition this array by this pivot point don't worry about that or oh, then we're going to move to the left and on the left we have from 0 to 3 and here we have the index number and we're going to choose 2 as pivot and the pivot will be uh, at index 1 okay and we'll stop when we see the left is greater than right and we'll consider whenever we implement the algorithm then we'll see how this works so the 2 will move to this index 2 and we partition this left subarray into two halves the left part is less than and the right part is greater than so we have uh, partition this array by considering uh, pivot as 2 now let's go to the left on the left we have 1 at index 0 we'll consider pivot this element 1 itself so nothing need to be done here only we have only one element 
and for the implementation of algorithm we will see this to base sketch left is greater than right and here when we move to the right uh, left is greater than right so we'll stop and we'll see it when we implement the algorithm now let's go to the right of this node let's consider this is a node so let's go to the right of this node and here we have a 2 3 so in between 2 and 3 let's pick 3 as pivot so if we pick 3 as pivot then it will move to the index 2 this will be represented something like this and then we have on the left 2 1 this is for our algorithmic analysis this is for our algorithms implementation we'll see then uh, how it works I break it down every single things uh, so that you can understand it better then we have here 3 and 3 and we have only one element so nothing need to be done here uh, this is pivot and we have to do nothing here and here we have two left and right uh, for the recursion call now let's go to the right we're done with the left of this root now let's go to the right and in this case we have 5 and 8 and here if we pick if we pick 8 as our pivot in between this index 5 and 8 then our pivot would be at 7 at index 7 so it will be represented something like this and if we keep doing this process it will be something like this then our sixth pivot and here 6 will move here then we have only 7 7 is pivot so nothing need to be done here then only 9 left so 9 is pivot and nothing need to be done here and the array is sorted so we're partitioning the array by selecting a pivot until the entire array is sorted we're doing this in in pledge so this will not cost any extra memory but this will works in constant and space complexity now let's see how this actually works and how we can oh now let's see how we can partition the array by selecting a pivot point all right on the right we have our tree recursion tree and this is our pivot initially i will point to the out of this array this is p then z will point to the first element to our array now we're going to check if z is less than or equals to pivot then we'll move i that means we'll increase the value of i i will move to the next and we'll solve i and z in this case we see that 5 is not greater than or equals to 8 so we'll just move j to the next element so j will move to this element now we're going to check if 5 is greater than or equals to 4 we're going to move i to the next let's move i right over here and now what are we going to do we're going to swap i and j if we swap them we get 4 here and we get 8 here now let's move z to the next element if we move z to the next element z will point to this element 3 and here what we're going to do we're going to check if 5 is greater than or equals to z where j is point to and we see 5 is greater than 3 so we're going to move i to the next element the next element is 8 in this case so let's move here i and let's swap i and j if we swap i and j it will move right here and j will move to the left right here okay now let's move z to the next element and j will move right here now j is pointing to this element 6 now let's check if 5 is greater than or equals to 6 then we'll swap i and j we see that 5 is not greater than 6 so we'll not swap let's move z to the next so now j is pointing to this element 1 and in this case we see that 5 is greater than 1 so what are going to do we're going to move i to the next we'll move i right here and we're going to swap this i and j so 8 will move here and 1 will move right here now let's move z to the right and z will point to this element 7 and we see that 5 is not greater than 7 so let's move z to the next z will point here and here you see 2 is less than 5 so 5 is greater than 2 uh, so what are we going to do we're going to move i to the next i will move here then we're going to swap 2 and 6 that means i and j so 2 will move here and 6 will move here now let's move i to the next element the next element is 9 so z is pointing here 9 is greater than 5 so nothing need to be done here 
again let's move z to the next now z is pointing to p and we say that p is less than or equals to z so what are we going to do we're going to move i to the next i will move right here and we're going to swap i and z if we swap them 8 will move here and 5 will move here all right we're done with the first iteration after the first iteration we see that we partitioned this array into two halves something like this so after the first iteration we get this array and we partitioned this array at the pivot point 5 now let's solve this for the left subarray let's pick this is just pivot this is our pivot and i is pointing to out of this array boundary then z pointing here we see 4 is a greater than 2 so nothing need to be done here let's move z to the next element here the same thing uh, 3 is greater than 2 so nothing need to be done here let's move z to the next and here we see that 1 is less than 2 so we're going to move i to the next element i will point right over here and then we're going to swap i and j so 1 will move here and 4 will move here now let's move z to the next element the next element is 2 so z will move here and we see we see that z is less than or equals to p so they are equal so we're going to move i to the next i will move here and we're going to swap this to i and j so 2 will move here and 3 will move here so after this iteration we get this array and here we partitioned this array by this pivot point 2 so we get this array something like this and this is how we'll be doing this partitioning by selecting pivot point and here only we have one if we select this as pivot nothing need to be done here since this is already in its correct position and then here we'll take pivot right here and we'll we'll partition this subarray and then we'll partition this subarray by taking a pivot point so if we take pivot as at one then we will have this as pivot and then we'll take pivot here then it will be swapped and this will be something like this and then we'll take pivot 8 then we'll partition then we'll get something like this then we'll take pivot right here 6 then it will be something like this then we have 7 then we have 9 and this is how we can solve this problem and this is how quick shot works hope you have understood the concept of quick shot algorithm now let's see the algorithm for this problem this is the algorithm for quick shot we're calling this quick shot function with nums array and start is the here start is the index of the first element end is the index of the last element then we're checking if start is less than end then we're going to find out pivot then we're going to call with the left and then we're going to call with the right that means from start to pivot we're going to partition this array from zero to the pivot minus one and then we're going to partition this array uh, from pivot plus one to the end and then we have the here partitions pivot equals to end then i equals to start minus one for j from start to end if nums j is less than or equals to the pivot element then we're going to we're going to increase i that means we're going to move i to the next and then we're going to swap i and j and at the end we'll return i and this is how it works uh, for sake of understanding let's assume we're given this array and this is your recursion call tree and we're uh, stop calling this function recursively when we uh, find out the value left is greater than right and here we see left is greater than right and here we have it, okay and you can take a look at this recursion call tree then you will understand this problem pretty easily here we have the start and end index and here we have the pivot point for that recursive call and here we have the start and end index and this is the partitioned result and this will be returned by this partition functions and for is the pivot this is how quick shot works let me show you one more time all right so this is our recursion call tree and this is your given array for sake of understanding and for first for first call we'll have a pivot point five and then two then one then three four then here we have eight then six then seven then nine and we're done and this is how it works hope you have understood the concept of quick shot algorithm this is how quick shot works if you're not understanding take a look at this 
a recursion call stack and you can see how it works and we have explained how uh, we can uh, partition the array now let's see the runtime complexity for this problem we're modifying the given array in flat so we're not using any additional space so the space complexity is bigger of one that means it works in constant space complexity now let's see the runtime analysis here we break it down each line and we have to calculate the time for the n n is the length of the given array this operation takes big of one this takes big of n then this takes uh, t of n divided two since you are dividing this array into two halves by the pivot point and here as well and the uh, function partition it takes big of n we you can see here and this operation takes big of n now if we add all of them t of n equals to big of one plus big of one plus t uh, n divided 2 t n divided 2 plus n since it takes big of n now t of n equals to t of n divided 2 plus t of n divided 2 plus n here it takes in steps or in executions to find out the partition uh, to partition the array now if we do back substitutions we can find out the uh, time complexity let's see so this is our given uh, equation and we get this equation by adding these two and they are the same so two times uh, t n divided 2 plus n if we substitute n by n divided 2 in equation uh, 1 then we get this equation and if we substitute this equation 2 in equation 1 then we get this equation again if we substitute n by n divided 4 then we get this equation and if we substitute this equation 3 into 1 then we get this equation and here we find out a pattern the pattern identified is that this pattern we're calling uh, our function quick short recursively at some point we'll call with the element one uh, so in that times it will takes only one operation so we can consider t of in uh, divided 2 to the power i equals to 1 so in divided 2 to the power i equals to 1 if we consider that uh, and if we solve this uh, then we get i equals to log 2 n and if we replace i to this equation then we get something like this and if we solve this equation we get this equation n times t of n divided 1 and the base case here is that t of 1 equals to 1 and when we're calling the functions with the element 1 that will take only one operations and that will execute just for one times so t of 1 equals to 1 and here we get this equation n plus log of 2n times n and if we solve this we get bigger of n times log 2n and this is how we can find out the random complexity for this algorithm quick short so the overall runtime complexity is big of n log n time complexity and it will take big of n space complexity since we're not using any additional space but for recursion call stack uh, it will take big of n space complexity hope you have understood the concept of quick shot algorithm if you're not understanding let us know thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video bye bye hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about a sorting algorithm heap sort what is heap sort algorithm heap sort is one of the sorting algorithms used to arrange a list of elements in order heap sort algorithm uses one of the three concepts called binary heap binary heap data structure is also called heap data structure if we are given this particular array we have to sort this array in ascending order using heap sort algorithms now how we can sort a given array in ascending order using heap sort algorithm now let's talk about that for example let's say we're given this array first what are we going to do we're going to construct a binary heap data structure from this array we're going to scan this array from left to right and then we will construct our binary heap data structure and then we will extract our head node and we will put that to the first position and then again we'll extract then we'll put that head to the second position and so on and we'll see that how we can do that now let's construct our heap data structure 
first we have this element 6 so 6 is our root and we have left and right child null by default then our next element is 4 when you have only one node we don't have to worry about if you find now we have this node 4 let's now let's insert this node 4 as a left child of this node 6 now let's do hippify if we do hippify here we see the parent of 46 so let's swap them since parent is greater than the current node so 4 will goes here and 6 will goes here then our next element is 7 so let's insert 7 right over here here we're constructing min heap okay we're not constructing max if if you're not understanding how we're constructing binary heap don't worry about it we have a complete section what we have talked about binary heap in details now let's do hippify we see 7 in its correct position because the parent is less than the current 7 is greater than 4 then our next element is 3 let's insert 3 as the left child of this node 6 now let's do hippify we see 3 is less than parent parent is 6 so let's swap them so we have swapped 3 and 6 now the parent of 3 is 4 we see 4 is greater than 3 so let's swap them if we swap if we swap 3 and 4 then 3 will move here and 4 will move here now the next element is 1 let's insert 1 to the right child of this node 4 and we see 4 is less than and we see 4 is greater than 1 so let's swap them 1 will move here and 4 will move here then the parent of 1 is 3 we see 3 is greater than 1 so let's swap them 3 will move here and 1 will move here then the next element is 2 let's insert 2 to the left child of this node 7 now let's do hippify here we see 7 is greater than 2 so let's swap them 2 will move here and 7 will move here then we see the parent of 2 is 1 and 1 is less than 2 uh, so we have found the correct position of this node 2 then the next element is 5 let's insert 5 to the right child of 2 and here we see that 5 is greater than 2 so nothing need to be done here we have constructed our binary heap data structure now what are we going to do we're going to extract the head node from our heap data structure and we're going to insert that to the first index for the first iteration of this while loop then in the second iterations we're gonna get the head node and we're gonna update the value at index one and so on let's see how we can do that so first we're going to extract this node one if we extract this node one we get one so let's update the value at index zero with one now what are we going to do we're going to get the deepest node first so what is the deepest node the deepest node is the node that we get by traversing a binary heap using level order traversal if we traverse this binary to using level order then we get five so five is the deepest node now we're going to update the value one with the value of the deepest node so let's update this value so let's update the value one with five and we're going to remove this node five okay we have extracted the head node after extracting the head node we have to hippify the binary heap now what are we going to do we're going to find out the minimum of left and right child so minimum of left and right child we see two so we're going to swap five and two since five is a greater than two so let's swap them five goes here two goes here now we see that for this node we have only one left child and we see the left child is greater than five so nothing need to be done here we're done now in the next iteration of this for loop we're going to extract the head two so let's extract this head two and let's insert it to this position so we have extracted the head node now what we're going to do we're going to find out the deepest node seven is the deepest node so let's update the value two with seven and let's delete the deepest node as well and let's delete the deepest node now let's find out the minimum of left and right child the, the minimum is a three so let's swap them and we see the minimum is three so let's swap seven and three 
three moves here and seven moves here okay now let's find the minimum of left and right child of seven we see the minimum is four so let's swap seven and four seven goes here and four goes here we're done okay for the next iteration of this for loop let's extract the head here is three so we're going to update the value seven with three now we're gonna update the value three with the deepest node and that is seven so let's update the value of this node three with seven and also we have to remove the deepest node now we have to call a function hivify to hivify the binary hiv now let's find the minimum child and that is four let's swap four and seven so let's swap four and seven seven moves here and four goes here now we have only one left child for this node seven so let's swap them since six is less than seven six move here and seven move here we're done for the next iteration of this for loop we're going to extract four so let's extract four and let's update this value with four and we're going to get the deepest node seven is the deepest node so let's remove seven and let's update root node with seven now let's find the minimum on the left and right the minimum is five so let's swap five and seven five goes here and seven goes here for the next iteration of this for loop we're gonna get the head node that is five so let's extract five and let's update this value one with five let's update this value five with seven the deepest node is seven here so let's update this node with seven and let's do a hivify here and here you see we have only one node the left node and left node is less than this root node so let's swap seven and six seven goes here and six goes here for the next iteration of this for loop we're gonna get the head node that is six so let's update two with six and let's update six here with the deepest node that is seven so now we have only one node that is seven the left and right pointer we can consider null for the next iteration of this for loop we're going to get this head node and we're going to update five with seven okay and then we're gonna remove this node and we're done this is how heap sort algorithm works first we have to construct our heap data structure then we have to extract from our heap data structure and then we have to update the array by extracting from our heap data structure if you're not understanding insert and extract method don't worry about that we have a complete section in this course check the section binary heap this is how heap sort works heap sort algorithm will take speak of in log n time complexity or n is the length of the given array and it will take constant space complexity i have attached the source code where we use space complexity big of n if we can construct our heap data structure by modifying our given array then you can solve this problem in constant space complexity but that makes this problem a lot harder that's why we're creating a new array to create our heap data structure don't worry about that i have attached the source code to this video for easy implementation we're not constructing our heap data structure by modifying our given array hope you've understood this video explanation this is all about heap sort algorithm. We're using here min heap data structure. You can use max if if you use max if then you have to update our array from right to left. And the process is exactly the same. Hope you have understood what is heap sort algorithm and how it works. I have attached the source code. Check the source code. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next video hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about what is recursion recursion is a method of solving a small problem where the solution depends on solutions to the smaller instances of the same problem the properties of recursion we have three properties of recursion 
same operation is performed multiple times with different input in every step we try to make the problem smaller and we must need to have a base condition which tells system going to stop the recursion and these are the formal definition of recursion now let's take an example to understand recursion here we have properties of recursion same operation is performed multiple times with different input in every step we try to make this problem smaller and we should have a base condition this is an awesome gift box inside this gift box we might have some gifts now let's open this box inside this box we have another box let's open this box inside this box we have another box let's open this box again inside this box we see we have another box here we see that we're doing same task multiple times okay here we're doing same operation multiple times now let's open this box again we see inside this box we have another box now let's open this box again finally we find out awesome gift and this is amazing gift gold ring so here what you understood we understood that we're performing same task multiple times with different inputs and in each step we try to make the problem smaller we're opening the box we're opening the box okay we're doing the same task we must need to have a base condition which tells the system going to stop the recursion so this is our base kit so this gold ring is the base kit so we're repeating same task multiple times in every step with a different input so we're making our problem smaller in each step and this is our base condition when you find out our gold ring we will stop and this is exactly similar to recursion now let's try to understand recursion with code we're given a binary search tree and we want to search a value in this binary search tree this is the algorithm to search a value in this binary search tree this method takes two parameter root and value inside here if true equals to null will return null this is base condition else if root root value equals to value if the value of root node equals to the given value then we will return the root node else if we are checking if root dot value is greater than value then we will call with the left subtree else we will call with the right subtree let's say we call this method with the root 8 and with the value 6 we have to search the value 6 in this binary search tree here you see that root is not equals to null and 8 is not equals to 6 and we see the value of root node is greater than the given value 8 is greater than 6 so let's call it left subtree with this subtree we see that 3 is not equals to 6 and 3 is not null for the recursive call now we're going to check does root dot value is greater than value no 3 is not greater than 6 so let's call with right subtree with this subtree we have only one node here and here we see 6 equals to 6 so we will return the node 6 in fact in this code we have our base condition this is our base condition if it equals to null then we'll return null else if root dot value equals to value then we'll return the root this is our base condition here we saw that in every step we try to make this problem smaller here we are doing same operation multiple times with different inputs okay so here we're doing the same operation with different inputs and in every step we try to make this problem smaller so in every step we are making the problem smaller first we call with the entire tree then we'll call with the left subtree then we call with the right subtree and we must need to have a base condition and this is our base condition hope you have understood what is recursion and how it works recursions internally uses a stack for recursive function call now let's talk about why we should learn recursion recursion makes code easy to write compared to iteration when a given problem can be broken down into smaller problem it is heavily used in tree graph etc and recursion 
heavily used in techniques like divide and conquer dynamic programming. There are many use cases of recursion. In this course, we saw a lot of algorithms uses recursion. Hope you have understood what is a recursion and why you should learn it. If you have any issue understanding this video explanation or if you have any suggestion, let us know. Thanks for watching. I will see you in the next video. Welcome back to this video. In this video, we are going to talk about format of recursion. We have two cases for recursive function, base catch and recursive catch. Base catch is the catch where the function does not recur. That means where the function stop. Recursive catch is the catch where the function recur. So for recursive function, we'll have two cases, base catch and recursive catch. The function stop at base catch and the function will calling the function for recursive catch. Let's say we want to find out the factorial of 5. How we can find out factorial of 5? We'll call recursively something like this factorial 4, factorial 3, factorial 2, factorial 1. And this is our base catch. For factorial 1, we'll return 1. Then we'll have 2 times 1 equals to 2. So for factorial 2, it will return 2. 2 times 3 equals to 6. So for factorial 3, it will return 6. 6 times 4 equals to 24. So for factorial 4, it will return 24. 24 times 5 equals to 120 and that will return to factorial 5 and this is the format of recursion this is the base catch and we are calling recursively factorial 4 factorial 3 factorial 2 these are called recursive catch and this is the code to find it factorial of a number this is base catch and this is our recursive catch n times factorial n minus 1 hope you have understood what is the format of recursion? Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to talk about how recursion works internally. Recursion is a process in which a function calls itself directly or indirectly. This is the formal definition of recursion. For recursion, we have two cases base case and recursive case. And we'll talk about that. In this video, we're going to talk about how recursion works internally. Recursion uses a stack data structure for recursive function call. Now let's see how function call works. We have this main function. Inside this function, we call another function foo. Inside this foo function, we call another function bar. And this is bar function. And inside this bar function, we print it I am bar. How it actually works? In the stack, first this main function is stored. When we call this main function, inside this function we have foo. So before printing I am main, so it will call this function foo. So foo get placed in the stack memory. Inside foo, we have another function bar. Before executing this print, we have to call this bar function. So bar function get placed into stack. Then inside this bar function, it will just print I am bar. Then this bar will be popped out from stack. Then it will move to this print statement since we're done with this bar function call. Now it will print I am foo. Now for this main function, the foo function popped out from the stack. So this function call is done. So this function has been executed. Now let's go to the next line. This is print. So it will print I am main. And this is how function call works and function uses is tag now let's see how recursive function works let's say we want to find out factorial of a given integer and this method takes one parameter in inside here we're checking if n equals to one then we'll return one else we'll return n times factorial n minus one and here we're calling this function recursively and this is base condition and this is recursive condition now let's see how it works if we now now let's see how it works if we call factorial 5 then the factorial 5 will get placed into a stack all right and here the order of recursive function call first we call with factorial 5 then 5 times factorial 4 then 4 times factorial 3 then 3 times factorial 2 then 2 times factorial 1 
first factorial 5 get placed into stack memory then factorial 4 then factorial 3 then factorial 2 then factorial 1 and here we see for this function call it match the base sketch so it will return 1 so 2 times 1 equals to 2 so for this function call 2 it will return 2 so factorial 1 is popped out from stack now let's calculate the value value is 3 times 2 equals to 6 so 6 will be returned to this function call so this factorial 2 will be popped out from stack and 4 times 6 equals to 24 and this 24 will be returned to this function call factorial 4 so this is popped out and factorial 4 return 24 24 times 5 equals to 120 here factorial 4 return 24 and 5 times 24 is 120. So factorial 5 return 120. So finally, the result of factorial 5 is 120. This is how this recursion works. And this is how we can find out factorial of a number. This is how recursive function call works. Hope you have understood how recursion works internally. The time complexity for this function call is big of n and the space complexity is big of n as well for the recursive function called stack. All right guys, thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to this video. In this video, we're going to solve a problem Fibonacci series using recursion. Fibonacci series is a list of numbers. The first two number is one. Then the next number is generated by adding the previous two number. So 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, 5 plus 3 is 8, and so on. Now we have to implement a method fiv that will take an integer and that will return the nth Fibonacci number from Fibonacci series. Let's see how. This is the code to find out nth Fibonacci number. This method fiv takes one parameter n as input. Inside here, we are checking if n is greater than or equals to 3, then we will return by adding fiv n minus 1 plus fiv n minus 2. Otherwise, we will return 1. Here, this is our base sketch and this is our recursive sketch. Now, let's see how it actually works. This is going to be a little bit critical to understand. Don't worry, I will explain everything. So if we call this fifth method with five, that means we have to find out the fifth Fibonacci number for Fibonacci series. So the fifth number in this series we see five. So if we call fifth five, then it should return five. But how it return five? Now let's find out. Here we have written fifth in minus one. So let's go to the left. Fifth four. Now let's go to the left again until we hit this base condition let's go to the left again and here we see n is greater than equals to 3 this condition false 2 is not greater than equals to 3 so it will return 1 this is base sketch so we're done with this function call for fiv3 now let's call now let's call this function fiv n minus 2 that is fiv3 minus 2 1 fiv1 one will return 1 because this is base condition and we'll add this two one and one and we'll return that to this fiv three. So let's return here two. So we're done with this function called fiv n minus one for fiv four. Now let's go to the right, that means to this function call fiv n minus two, and that is fiv two. This function call will hit this base sketch, so it will return one. Two plus one is three. Here we'll return three. So we're done with this function call for Fiv five. Now let's go to this function call fiv n minus two. So fiv n minus two is five minus two is three. So fiv three. This function call will not hit the base sketch. Now let's call fiv n minus one for this fiv three. Here we have fiv two. So let's return here one. Now let's go to the right. That means to this function call for this fiv three. Here we have fiv one. So we'll return here one. So one plus one is two. Here we'll return two. And finally, we'll return 3 plus 2, that is 5. And this is how we can find out nth Fibonacci number from Fibonacci series using recursion. Hope you have understood how to find out 
in Fibonacci number from Fibonacci series. Now let's check another example for a better understanding. Now let's call this Fib function with 6. So we have to find out the 6th number from Fibonacci series that is 8. So let's find out this number 8 using this code. Now we're going to call Fib in minus 1 recursively until we hit this base case. So Fib 5, then Fib 4, then Fib 3, then Fib 2. So this hit the base case, so it will return 1. Now let's call this Fib n minus 2 for Fib 3. So we get Fib 1, it will return 1 as well. So 1 plus 1 is 2. So we're done with Fib n minus 1 for Fib 4. Now let's go to Fib n minus 2 for Fib 4. And this is Fib 2, so it will hit this base case, so it will return 1. 1 plus 2 is 3. So this function call will return 3. For Fib 5, we're done with this Fib n minus 1. Let's call Fib n minus 2. So we get here Fib 3. Now let's go to Fib n minus 1. And this function call will hit the base case, so it will return 1. This function call will hit the base case since n equals to 2, so it will return 1. Now let's call n minus 2 for Fib 3. So we get Fib 1, it will return 1 as well. So 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 plus 3 is 5. Now let's call Fib n minus 2 for Fib 6. Fib 4, now let's go to left. Fib 3, again let's go to left. Fib 2. So it will return 1. Let's go to right. It will return 1 as well. So 1 plus 1 is 2. Let's go to right for Fib 4. That means to Fib n minus 2, we get Fib 2. So it will return 1. So 2 plus 1 is 3. 3 plus 5 is 8. So for this function called Fib 6, we'll return 8. This is how this code works. And this is how we can find out nth Fibonacci number from Fibonacci series. Hope you have understood how recursion works. This is a recursion call tree. In this code, we are repeating same task multiple times. Here we have calculated the value for Fib 3. Here we are calculating again. Here we have calculated the value for Fib 4. Here we are calculating again. We can reduce the function call using dynamic programming. If we apply here dynamic programming, then we will not have any repetition of function call. And that we will talk about in dynamic programming section of this course. Hope you have understood how to find out nth Fibonacci number from Fibonacci series. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about recursion versus iteration for recursion and iteration let's find out first space efficiency and time efficiency for recursion we have to call a function recursively we have to add element on a stack and we have to remove element from a stack and that will takes some amount of space in the memory for recursion okay and for iteration it will not take any extra space for time efficiency we have to add element on a stack and that will take some times and you have to call the function recursively that takes some times but for loops it takes less time than recursion for space efficiency and time efficiency iteration is the winner for ease of code that means when we have problems that problems can be broken down into smaller sub problem and that is called ease of code to solve sub problem the recursion is recommended where iteration is not for ease of code recursion is the winner now when to use recursion and when to avoid recursion now let's talk about that when to use when we can easily break down a problem into similar sub problem then we should use recursion when you are okay with extra overhead space and time okay the space complexity and time complexity then we can consider recursion when you need a quick working solution instead of efficient one then we have to use recursion now when to avoid recursion if the response to any of the above statement is no, then we should not go with recursion. In that case, we should consider iteration. 
that means loops so we have to use recursion when you can easily break down a problem into smaller sub problem and if you are okay with extra overhead and for a quick solution we should consider recursion now let's see some practical uses of recursion stack tree sorting algorithm quick sort my sort for two traversal searching insertion deletion divide and conquer dynamic programming graph etc there are many use cases of recursion recursion almost mandatory for tree problems and there are many use cases of recursion we already saw a lot of recursive function in this course all right guys thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about what is hashing hashing is a method of indexing data the idea behind hashing is to allow large amount of data to be indexed using keys the most popular use for hashing is the implementation of hash table hashing is commonly used for password verification or for password authentication now you might think why we should learn hashing we have a lot of different data structure array data structures will take logarithmic time complexity for finding an element in a sorted array in linked list it will take linear time complexity for tree it will take logarithmic time complexity it will take logarithmic time complexity for binary search tree and for avl tree here we see array and tree will take logarithmic time complexity and linked list will take linear time complexity where hashing will take for the best cases constant time complexity and for the worst cases it will take linear time complexity this is why we should learn hashing hashing will take constant time complexity that super efficient for the best cases we can assume on the average cases hashing will take constant time complexity so we see that constant time complexity is way more better than logarithmic time complexity for this reason we should learn hashing this is an array of length 16 we have index number from 0 to 15 let's say we want to store the string a v c d f and x y z in this array then what you will do what you will do will store these three strings in this array and if you want to find out the string we will scan the whole array to find out the string a v c d f or x y z so if we store the string into this array the search operation will take linear time complexity but using hashing we can find the string in the array in constant time for the average cases first thing what i'm going to do i'm going to find out an integer value from this string for that we will call a hash function with this string let's say the hash function will return six for this string and for this string the hash function will return 15 and for this string the hash function will return 11 now what we're going to do we're going to store avc at index 6 in this array and we're going to store this string def at index 15 and we're going to store this string xyz at index 11 now if you want to find out the element avc first what we're going to do we're going to find out the hash value of this a string let's say we want to find out avc first what i will do we'll find out the hash value for avc when you call this string with hash function then the hash function will return a hash value so we find it here the hash value is six now we're going to move at index six in this array now we're going to look up at index six in this array and we're going to compare these two elements avc and here we see avc and we see they are the same so will return true because you found the element in the array and this is called the hashing data structure this hashing is widely used in real world the hashing function is way more complicated 
but the core principle is the same. Here how we're finding out this hash value. We're using a simple function. We're passing this string into the hash function and we're adding all the ASCII value for the character in these strings. We're adding the ASCII value of A plus the ASCII value of B plus the ASCII value of C. And we're going to calculating the mode for the summation of the ASCII value. And we'll see how we're calculating this hash value. We'll see a simple hash function, but in the real world, the hash function is way more complicated. In the next video, we'll see hashing terminology, hash function, hash value, collision. Now let's talk about application of hashing. Hashing provides constant time search, insert and delete operation on average. This is why hashing is one of the most used data structure. Example problems are distinct element, counting frequencies of items, finding duplicates. For solving these problems or these types of problems, we use hashing. Actually, we'll use hash tables to solve this type of problems. The hash table uses hashing data structure internally. For masses digest, we use hashing. This is an application of cryptographic hash functions. Password verifications. For password verifications, we use hashing. Cryptographic hash functions are very commonly used in password verification. Compiler operations uses hashing. The famous Robin Curve algorithm uses hashing. Linking file name and path together on our PC or computer uses hashing data structure. Now let's see practical uses of hashing. Now let's assume this is Facebook server and this is your computer. Here we're trying to log in into our Facebook account. Let's assume this is your Facebook account. Email, this is the email and this is the password. Now we can store this password into the server. If we store the plain password 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, if somehow server hacked by hacker, then hacker can access our account. And if this is your information for your bank account or for online account, if the server get hacked and if the plain password you store on the server, then the hacker can access your information and the hacker can steal a lot of lot of monies. And that's not secured. Instead of storing the plain password, what I will do will generate hash value. The hash value for this password is this hash value okay instead storing this plain password will store this hash value onto the server when you enter this email and this password on your computer the password will be converted into the hash value by a hash function and you can access the account if we enter the correct password we don't have to remember this hash values we just have to remember our password and this is secured for password authentication, we use hashing data structure. There are a lot of hashing functions that can generate hash values. In the real world, hashing functions are way more complicated, but the core logic is the same. Another popular use of hashing is hash table. Hash table data structure uses hashing data structure internally. Using a hash table, we can make our program super efficient. And there are a lot of applications of hashing data structure. In the next video, we're going to talk about hashing terminologies. See you in the next video. In this video, we're going to talk about hashing terminologies. First, let's talk about a hash function. A hash function is a function that can be used to map data of arbitrary site to data of fixed site. The hash function will take input from user and it will generate hash values from the given token. Now let's talk about key. Key is the data given by user. What is a hash value? The values returned by hash functions are called hash values, hash code, digest, also it's called simply hashes. What is hash table? It is a data structure which implements an associative array, abstract data type, a structure that can map key to values. It uses hash function to compute the hash code. Hash table data structure internally uses hashing data structure. Using hash table, 
we can store pair of data onto hash table we can access data on hash table on average in constant time and that's super efficient now what is collision for hashing a collision occurs when two different key to a hash function produce the same output called hash value if the hash function return same value or same hash values for different inputs then it's called collisions for collisions the hashing data structure will take for the worst cases linear time complexity if there is no collision then it will take constant time complexity no matter what in this section of this course we'll see how to resolve collisions for hashing data structure so hash function will take key as input and it will return hash value if hash function return same hash value for different inputs then collisions arise and we have to resolve collision for that we have to choose a good hash function in the collision resolution techniques video we will talk about how to handle collisions when a hash functions return same hash value for different inputs in the next video we're going to talk about hash function see you in the next video hey you also guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about hash function this is a simple hash function this function takes two parameter a string s and an integer n here we're converting the string into character array and here using this variable we're adding the ascii value for the character in the given string and here we're calculating the ascii value using this formula after calculating the ascii value we are returning some modulus n this is the simple hash function now let's assume this is an array of length 16 we have here index from 0 to 15 for string avc for string def and for string xyz if we call if we call this hash function with string abc and 16 then it will return 6 if we call with this string and constant value 16 it will return 15 and for xyz it will return 11 here we call this function hash function it's written 6 now let's see how it's written 6 first we add the ascii value for a for b and for c so 65 is the ascii value for a 66 for b and 67 for c if we add all the ascii value we get 198 198 modulus 16 equals to 6 so for this input this function written 6 for this string df it's written 15 now we find out a number 6 now what we're going to do we're going to insert this string at index 6 in this array so let's insert here abc now let's call this function with df and 16 it's written 15 here we're adding the ascii value ascii value of d is 68 ascii value of e is 69 and ascii value of f is 70. if we add the ascii value we get 207 207 modulus 16 equals to 15. If you don't know what is ascii value ascii value is a value behind each key on our keyboard for all the characters we have a ascii value if you want to see the ascii table then search on google ascii table for a we have ascii value 65 for b we have ascii value 66 for lowercase a we will have a different ascii value for each key on our keyboard we have a ascii value if you want to see the list of ascii value just search on google table of ascii value then you will see the list of ascii value this is ascii table here we have ascii value for each character here for a b c for uppercase a b c we see here the ascii value 65 66 67 for d f you see the ascii value here 68 69 70 and for x y z we have here ascii value 88 89 and 90. now here we find out the index an integer 15 from this function this is hash value now we're going to insert this string at index 15 so let's insert here def now let's call with xyz the ascii value of x is 88 ascii value of y is 89 ascii value of z is 
90. If we add all the ASCII values, we get 267. 267 modulus 16 equals to 11. We find out here hash value 11 for this string. So let's insert XYZ at index 11. Now if you want to check does this string df exist or not in our hashing data structure. First we're going to call hash function with this string df and with the value 16. Then we'll find out the value 15. Now at index 15 we're gonna check does at index 15 we have the string df. We see here yes we have df. So let's return true or something like that. So we encoded these strings into this integer and we store this string at this index. Okay. This is the concept of hash function. In a real world, hash function is way more complicated. But here we're showing you the simple, simple example of hash function. The core logic is the same. This is the core logic of a hash function. This is how hashing data structure works. So we can look up a data on hashing data structure in constant time on average. Now let's take different inputs. First thing AVL for string ACK and first thing ADZ. For AVL it will return 2, for ACK it will return 2 and for ADZ it will return 2. So for different inputs we find out same hash values. Now what we should store AVL, what we should store ACK and what we should store ADZ. Now the problem arises here. Let's see how we can find out the ASCII value. Of, if we call this hash function with AVL and with the constant 5 it will return 2. And this is how it's returning to. Here we have added all the ASCII value for the character AVL and we're finding out the modulus for 207 and 5 we find out 2. We're going to insert avl at index 2. Now if we call hash function with this string then we find it 2. Now what we should insert this string ack and also if we call this function with adz and 5 it's written 2. Now what we should insert adz. We already have an element at index 2. This spot is occupied already. What we should insert ack and what we should insert adz. And this is called collision. They're trying to go on a same index. This is a collision. Now what you should insert these three strings. For that first we have to understand collisions. Now where these two strings should go. Where you can place this two string ACK and ADZ. In order to understand that first we have to understand the collision resolution techniques. In the next video we will talk about collision resolution techniques. Now let's talk about the properties of a good hash function. The properties of a good hash function it should uniformly distribute hash values, it should be easy to calculate, it should minimize collisions and it should resolve any collisions. These are the characteristics of a good hash function. Now let's move to the next video. In the next video we will talk about collision resolution techniques. See you in the next video. In the previous video we saw that we have inserted the string avl at index 2 but we're not understanding how we should insert ack and adz this is happens because of collisions now we have to resolve collisions now let's talk about collision resolution techniques we can solve this problem in three ways now let's talk about that one by one now we're going to talk about collision resolution techniques. For collision resolution techniques, we can solve the collision using this direct swaying and we can solve collision resolution using open addressing. For open addressing, we have three ways, linear probing, quadratic probing and double hashing. First, let's talk about direct chaining. Then we'll talk about linear probing, quadratic probing and double hashing. What is direct chaining? Direct chaining implements the buckets as linked list. Colliding elements are stored in this list. Here we have four string AVK, AVL, SEK, ADZ. And here we have an array of length 16. Now let's talk about direct chaining. Now let's see how direct chaining works. Let's say we are given this string. So we call a hash function, the hash function return this hash value 1. We're not going to insert this string at index 1. Instead, we're going to create a linked list at index 1. Let's create a linked list here and let's 
insert this node at that link list so here we have a null link list now we're going to insert a node and in that node we'll insert this string now let's say we created this node with address 111 we have here this string and a null pointer now we're going to store the reference of this link list here so we're going to store this address so it will be represented something like this if we find out the hash functions return the same value one we will add the string to the next pointer of this node now for this string it's written two. now we're going to create a node avl and we're going to insert that at index 2 now here we're going to store the reference that means the address of this node that is 222 so let's insert here 222 then it will be represented something like this now our next string is ack now our next string is ack it's written the hash value 2 we saw that the index 2 already occupied by the string avl now what i'm going to do i'm going to create a new node and i'm going to add the referent of this node here so we're going to add this node as the next node of this node so it will be represented something like this now for this string we saw that it's written the hash value 2 we saw that index 2 already occupied by some elements now what we're going to do we're going to create a new node and we're going to add this node as the next node so we're going to store this reference here so we're going to adding this node as the next of this node so it will be represented something like this and this is called direct chaining let's say you want to find out the string ack will return true if this string exists in our hashing data structure for that what you will do first we'll call a hash function the hash function will return two now we're going to look up at index two here we see the first element we have in this node avl that's not equals to ack now we're going to move to the next node and that is here here we see ack so we find out this string for the worst case if collision happens the checking operation will take big of n time complexity that is the worst catch for the best catch on average it will take constant time complexity if you wanted to find out this string it will return the hash value one and we can look up at index one and that is avk if you want to find out this value avl then if we call hash function with this string the hash function will return two at index two we see the first element is avl so we'll return true so on average it will take constant time complexity now let's talk about open addressing for open addressing we have three ways to resolve a collision linear probing quadratic probing and double hashing now let's talk about linear probing what is open addressing in open addressing colliding elements are stored in other vacant buckets it will not store multiple element on the same spot like direct chaining so we're open we can use the vacant packets now let's talk about linear probing linear probing is a strategy for resolving collisions by placing the new key into the closest falling empty cell let's see how it works now we're going to talk about linear probing first we have this string now what we're going to do we're going to find out the hash value by calling a hash function so a hash function will written one at index one we're going to insert abk so let's insert here abk now for this string if we call hash function the hash function will return the hash value two so what are we going to do we're going to insert this value at index two we see the cell at index two is empty so let's insert the string here so let's insert abl at index two now we have the string ack here we see if we call hash function the hash function will return two at index two we have already an element the index two is already occupied so what are we going to do we're going to move to the next cell i'm going to check the next cell if the next cell is empty we're going to insert ack in the next cell here we see the cell is empty at index three so let's insert here ack now let's say we want to insert this uh, string if we call hash function if the hash function return two we're going to insert two at index two but we saw that the index two already occupied by an element 
Now what are we going to do? We're going to move to the next cell. We're going to check the next cell. We see the next cell is not empty. So we're going to move to the next cell. And here we see at index 4, this cell is empty. So we're going to insert a DJ right here. And this is called linear probing. If our current cell is empty, we're going to find out the closest vacant cell. And this is called linear probing. Hope you've understood what is linear probing. In linear probing, we're going to find out the closest vacant spot. If we find it vacant spot, then we'll insert that string or that data. Now, let's say we want to find out this string in our hashing data structure. If this string exists, we'll return true, otherwise we'll return false. First thing, what we'll do, we'll call a hash function with this string and the hash function will return true. If the hash function will return true, what we'll do, we will move at index 2 in this array. At index 2, we have this element avl. Now, what are we going to do? We're going to check this element adj and abl and they are not equal. Since this is linear probing, we're going to move to the next cell. Next cell is ack, but this is adj. So let's move to the next cell. The next cell is this cell. Here we have adj. So we found adj will return true. For the worst case, we have to traverse the entire hashing data structure and that will take of n time complexity. Hope you've understood what is linear probing. And for this string and for this string, if we search this two string, then it will return true in constant time. At index one, we have abk and at index two, we have avl. So we can search this two string in constant time. Since we have a collision, it might take linear time complexity. And this is the worst catch. Hope you have understood what is linear probing. Now let's talk about quadratic probing. What is quadratic probing? Quadratic probing operates by taking the original hash index and adding successive values of an arbitrary of an arbitrary quadratic polynomial until an open slot is found. This is the definition of quadratic probing. Now let's see how quadratic probing works. Let's say we have this first string. In quadratic probing, we're going to use this polynomial formula. For quadratic probing, we're going to use this polynomial. 1 square, 2 square, 3 square, 4 square, up to n square. Now let's insert this string. Now let's say we want to insert this string into our hashing data structure. First thing, what I will do, we'll call a hash function. Let's say hash function written 1. So at index 1, we're going to insert this string because at index 1, we see empty spot. So let's insert abk at index 1. Now you want to insert this string avl. If we call hash function with this string avl, the hash function will return 2. Now at index 2, we're going to insert this string. At index 2, we see we have empty spot. So let's insert a VL at index 2. Now we want to insert this string. If we call hash function, the hash function will return 2. If the hash function will return 2, we see that at index 2, we have an element already. The index 2 is already occupied. Now we have to resolve collision here because we found collision. In quadratic probing, what you will do, we will add one square to the returning value by the hash functions when a collision occurred. So we're going to add two and one square. We get here three. Now let's check at index three. We see we have an empty spot. So let's insert here ACK. Now let's say we want to insert this string ADZ. If we call hash function, let's say hash function written two. At index two, we have already an element. So we find out collision here. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to add one square to this written value. So one square plus two is three. At index three, we see we have an element. So we're going to take the next element. So we're going to take two square from this polynomial. Now we're going to take two square and we're going to add the written value by the hash functions. So two plus two square equals to six. Now let's check at index six. We see at index six, we have an empty spot. So let's insert here the string ADJ. Let's say we want to insert another string a. Let's say we want to insert another string a e i. If we call hash function, this string will return two. We see at index two we have already an element, so we cannot insert here two. By quadratic probing, let's resolve this collision. Now we're going to add one square to two. We get three. At index three we have an element, so we cannot insert here. Now let's check two square and let's add two square and two. We get six. At index six we have and elements so we cannot insert here as well now we're going to take this three square and we're going to add three square 
to this value too so we get 11. now at index 11 what are we going to do we're going to insert this element aei so let's insert here aei because here we have empty spot this is how quadratic probing works now let's say we want to find out this string in our hashing data structure and here we're using quadratic probing for collision resolution now what i'm going to do i'm going to check at index 2 at index 2 we have avl avl is not equal to aei now we're going to check the first value here and we're going to add it to this 2 at index 3 we have adz that's not equal to aei now we're going to check 2 square 2 square plus 2 equals to 6 at index 6 we have adz adz is not equal to aei now we're going to take the next from polynomial that is 3 square 2 plus 3 square equals to 11 now let's check at 11 we see aei we find out aei so we'll read and true this is how we can search an element in hashing data structure when we're resolving using quadratic probing hope you've understood quadratic probing now let's talk about the last one double hashing what is double hashing interval between probes is computed by another hash functions so in double hashing we use another hash functions so in double hashing we will use two hash function to resolve collision now let's see how we can do that now let's assume we want to insert the string avk if we call the hash one function then let's say it will return one if it's written one and at index one we see empty spot so let's insert here abk now we want to insert abl if we call this hash one function then it will return two at index two we have empty spot so let's insert here abl now we want to insert ack if we call hash one function let's assume it will return two if it will return two what i'm gonna do i'm gonna check at index two we see index two is already occupied by an element so we encountered collision now we're gonna call secondary hash function let's call a secondary hash function hash2 now we're gonna call another hash function with this string ack let's assume this function return 4 this is hash2 function and this is hash1 function now we're gonna apply this formula 2 plus i times 4 where the value of i is 1 to 3 up to n initially i equals to 1 so we get 2 plus 1 times 4 equals to 6 now we're going to check at index 6 at index 6 we see we have an empty spot so let's insert here ack now we want to insert this string into hashing data structure for that first we're going to find out the hash value we call this hash function and let's say it will return 2 and at index 2 we have already an element so we encountered collision again now we have to resolve it for double hashing we're going to call now we're going to call another hash function with adz let's assume the secondary hash function returns 4 now here we'll apply this formula 2 plus 1 times 4 equals to 6 at index 6 we see we have an element so we're going to increase the value of i from 1 to 2 so 2 plus 2 times 4 equals to 10 at index 10 we see we have empty spot so let's insert here adz now let's say we want to insert this string into the hashing data structure first we're going to call with hash one function and let's say it written two and we see at index two we have an element so we encountered collision now we're going to call aei with hash two function let's assume the hash two function will return four and we're going to apply here this formula first six for i equals to one at six we have an element so let's increase the value of i and we get 10 and at 10 we have an element so we cannot insert here at 10 so let's increase the value of i from 2 to 3 now at index 14 we get 14 by increasing the value of i from 2 to 3 2 plus 3 times 4 equals to 14 at index 14 we see we have empty spot so let's insert here aei if we have another string if that string return 2 for hash1 function and if this has to return four for the given string now what we will do we'll check six at index six we have an element at index 10 we have an element at index 14 we have an element now we'll check at index two plus four times four equals to 18 and we see this index 18 is out of this hash stable boundary so what are going to do we're going to find out the modulus 18 modulus here we're going to use 16 so we're going to apply here this formula 18 modulus 16 and this is how we can solve collisions using double hashing hope you have understood the techniques of double hashing 
now if we want to find out the string a e i first what i'm going to do we're going to generate the hash value at index 2 we see we do not have the element a e i we're going to call with this hash to function and if it's written 4 we're going to apply this formula first we'll check at 6 then we'll check at 10 then we'll check at 14 at 14 we'll find out a e i and we'll return true and this is how double hashing works hope you've understood how to solve collision using collision using double hashing in the next video we'll talk about what you will do when our hashing data structure is full see you in the next video hey you what's up guys welcome back to this video in this video we're going to talk about pros and cons of collision resolution techniques for direct chaining we have no fear of exhausting hash table buckets we don't have to recreate the hashing data structure to insert new elements but we have fear of big linked list it might create a big linked list that might cause us the slower time complexity for open addressing it's easy to implement but we have fear of exhausting hash table buckets we might have to create new hashing data structure for inserting new data when to choose direct chaining and when to choose open addressing if the input size is known then always we should consider open addressing and if the deletion is very high then we should always go for direct chaining and these are the pros and cons and hope you have understood when to choose direct chaining and when to choose open addressing thanks for watching this video i will see you in the next video now in this video we're going to talk about what we should do when our hashing data structure is full let's say we have here this six string and let's assume for this string the hash function return zero for this string hash function return one for this string two for this string three for this string hash function return four and for this string hash function return seven in this hashing data structure we have inserted this five strings avc abk avl sek and adj and we see the hashing data structure is full we cannot insert new strings to this hashing data structure the string return seven for direct chaining we can find out this hashing value that might fit in this range of index from zero to four we can use here a modulus operator and a constant integer to fit this seven in this range in that case we have to use direct chaining and we have to store the strings as a linked list but for open addressing we have to create a new hashing data structure of size the double of this existing hashing data structure so you have to create a hashing data structure in order to insert this string for open addressing now let's create a hashing data structure of length 10 the length of this hashing data structure is 5 and the length of this hashing data structure is 10 now we're going to iterate through this hashing data structure and we're gonna find out the index index of abc is 0 index of avk is 1 for abl 2 for sck 3 for adj 4 now if we want to insert this string into this data structure then what we should do we should check the index 7 and here we see we have empty spot so here we can insert the string alm so let's insert here alm here we see that this hashing data structure is exhausted we are creating new data structure if this data structure is full at the some point then we have to create the new hashing data structure of the double of this existing data structure here we're talking about this string if this hashing data structure is full and if we so the index that is not fit in this range of index then what we will do we will use a modulus operator and a constant let's say if we use here a constant 5 and modulus operator 7 modulus 5 equals to 2 so in that case it will moves here but if we do here open addressing we cannot place at any position because there is no vacant cell in that case we have to insert as the next of this element and all the element 
should stored as a linked list. So for open addressing, we might need to recreate the hashing data structure. But for direct chaining, we might have a long linked list and that might cause us slower accessing time and that will increase the time complexity. All right, guys, hope you have understood this video explanation. If you have any question, if you have any suggestion, or if you are not understanding, post your question in the Q&A forum. I will get to you. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Hey, you all guys. Welcome back to this video. In this video, we are going to talk about how hash map works internally. Here, we declare a hash map. Map string integer map equals to new hash map. Here, in this hash map, we want to store key value pairs string as key and integer as a value so we'll store key value pairs the default size of hash map is 16 load factor equals to 0 0.75 this is default load factor and threshold equals to 12 load factor means we can store 75 percent of the given size the 75 percent of 16 is 12 so we can store 12 items in the hash map. The size is 16, but we can store 12 items. So the default size is 16 and load factor is 0 0.75. Load factor 0 0.75 means we can load data 75% of 16. The 75% of 16 is 12. If it raised the load factor, that means if it raised the threshold, then the size of our hash map will be doubled. If we insert 11 items in the hash map, then nothing gonna happen. When we insert 12 items in the hash map, the hash map size will be doubled. Because here we have load factor 75. We can store 75% of 16. The 75% of 16 is 12. Whenever it raised this threshold, the size of our hash map will be doubled and this is the internal things we can't see when you insert 12th item the size of our hash map will be doubled we can specify the size and load factor to this hash map something like this here we are specifying the size and load factor let's say we inserted size equals to 10 and load factor equals to 1 so here we can store 100 percent of the size so here we can use 100 percent of size 10 so here we can insert 10 items when it raised this threshold the size of our hash map will be doubled when you insert ninth items then nothing gonna happen when you insert 10th item in the hash map the size of the hash map will be doubled for this size 10 and load factor equals to 1 hope you've understood how hash map works now let's see how it store data and how it's retrieve data now we're going to talk about how put method and get method works in hash map now we're going to talk about how put and get method work in hash map data structure now let's talk about that one important thing here is that hash map uses hashing data structure here we have an array of size 16 the default size of hash map is 16. Here we will store linked list. This is not array of integers. This is an array of linked list. If we declare this hash map, then we will create an array of linked list of size 16. Now if we insert the key avc and 1, then how it will be stored in the hash map and how we can get this key value from the hash map. Now let's see. First, we're going to generate hash value for this key avc and then we'll calculate index of this key using a formula. Now let's see the function to generate hash code or hash value from this key avc. Here, this is the hash code function. This function takes one parameter string as input. Inside here, we're converting the string into character array. Then we have here variable sum equals to zero and here using this for loop, we're adding the ASCII value of all characters in the given strings. Here we have character A, B, and C. And here we're adding the ASCII value of A, B, and C. And we'll return the ASCII value 
by this hash code function. This is a simple hash code functions. Hashmap uses advanced hash code function. But here for sake of understanding we're assuming we're just returning the sum of ASCII value of all characters in a given string. Now what are we going to do? We're going to find out index using a formula. This is the formula index equals to hash code key. It will return the hash code and here we're using this AND operator. This is a bitwise operator and here in minus one where n is the length of the hash map. Here n equals to 16. 16 minus 1 is 15. If we call this function with avc and 1, this function will return 294. 294 and 15 equals to here and operator. This is a bitwise and operator. If we call this 294 and 15, then we will get 6, the index 6. Now we're going to insert this key value pairs at index 6. But how we're going to insert the data at index 6 we're going to create a node the node will have four parts key value hash code and next pointer let's create a node here we created a node with hash value hash value here is 294 here the string avc and the value here one and the next pointer is null initially and the address of this node is 111 let's store the address of this node here we're storing the reference of this node so it will be represented something like this now let's insert this key value here the key is bcd and value is 2 if we call this a hash code function it will return 297 and using this formula we'll get the index 7 let's insert a node at index 7 with hash value 297 with the string as key and the value 2 and the next pointer is null initially Let's insert that node at index 7. Here the address of this node is 222. Let's insert this address here. This is the reference. Okay, here is storing the reference of this node. Then it will be represented something like this. So we have stored these two key value pairs, AVC1 and VCD2. Now let's insert this key value pair, DEF and 3. First, let's call this hash code with DEF. It will return 303 then index equals to 15. We'll get index equals to 15 by using this formula. Now let's insert this key value pairs at index 15. First let's create a node. This is the node. This is the node here we have hash value 303. We have string df. This is key value 3 and null. Let's store the address of this node here as reference. Then it will be represented something like this. Now let's insert key value here, ACE and 4. First, let's calculate the hash value. The hash value is 297 and let's find the index. Here index equals to 7. Now we're going to insert this key value pairs at index 7. But here we see that at index 7 we have already a node. So here is a collision. For solving collisions, HashMath uses direct chaining. Let's create a node and let's attach the node as the next node of this node. So let's create a node. This is the node. Address 297, ACE, 4 and null. Now here we're gonna store the reference of this node. This is the next node of this node. So let's store here 444. 4, 4. Then it will be represented something like this. Now let's insert AVC and 5. Here we see AVC is already exist. And here what I'm going to do, I'm going to just update the value 5 for this node. Here we're going to update this value 1 from 1 to 5. How we're going to do that? First let's find out the hash code. Hash code is 294. Now let's calculate index. Index equals to 6. Now let's go to at index 6. Now let's try to compare the key of this node with this key. We see they're equal. So we're going to update this value from 1 to 5. From 1 to 5. So let's update this value from 1 to 5. Now we're going to update the value of this node to 6 here. Okay, so we're going to update this 4 to 6. How are we going to do that? First, we'll call this function hash code. It will return 297. Now we're going to find it index. Index is 7. Now let's go to index 7. Here, index 7. Now let's compare this AC with this node. We're going to compare the key here. We see bcd and here sce they are not the same so let's try to move to the next node we clearly saw that we have a collision so we have to move to the next node this is the next node now let's try to compare sce and this key sce we see they are equal so what we're going to do here we're going to update this value from 
4 to this value 6. So let's update this value from 4 to 6. Then it will be represented something like this. If we call this method put with null and 7, what it will do? For null, this is the best case for hash math. For hash table, it will not work. But hash table accept null as key. For null key, it will return 0. So hash code will return 0. This is the base catch and let's calculate index. Index will be evaluated 0 if we apply this formula. Now at index 0, we're gonna store this key value here null and 7. This is the node with value null. Here we have hash code 0 and here value 7. And next pointer is null. Now let's store this address here and it will be represented something like this. This is how this put method works. Hope you've understood how put method works in hash math. Now let's see how get method works. Now if we call this method math.get with a vc it will return 5. How it will return 5? First it will calculate hash code. The hash code is 294 and now we're gonna calculate index. Index is 6. Now let's go to index 6 and here we'll compare this value with the first node value. Now we're gonna compare the key with the key of this first node. We see abc and abc are equal so we're going to return the value from this node so we're going to return the value from this node that is 5 so it's written 5 so it's written 5 now if we call this get method with bcd first we're going to calculate hash code hash code is 297 index is 7 so let's go to at index 7 here we're going to compare this bcd with this key bcd they're equal so we'll return 2 if we call this method get with ace here we have this key ace first let's find out the hash code hash code is 297 index is 7 now let's go to index 7 here we see bcd and ace they are not equal so let's move to the next node here we have a collision so we see ace and here ace they're the same so we'll return this value 6 this is how this get method works for the average case set, this put method and this get method will works in constant time complexity. If there is no collision, if there is a collision, then it might take big of in time complexity. Hope you've understood how HashMap works internally. This is how HashMap works. Here we have the simple hash code functions, but HashMap uses advanced hash code function to generate hash value, and they might use advanced techniques to find out the index from the hash value. This is the internal things of HashMap functions. This is how HashMap works and we see that HashMap uses hashing data structure. First we are converting the key into a hash value. From the hash value we are calculating index. Okay. So here we clearly see that HashMap data structure uses hashing data structure. Hope you have understood this video explanation. If you have an issue understanding this video explanation, let us know. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video.